Good afternoon, everybody. Please be seated. Routine proceedings, introduction of bills, committee reports, tabling of reports, ministerial statements, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, and I would indicate that the required 90 minutes notice prior to routine proceedings was provided in accordance with our Rule 26, Bracket 2. Would the Honorable Minister please proceed with his statement? Madam Speaker, I rise today to bring awareness to excess moisture that has brought great difficulty to our producers this year. I want to extend my gratitude to our Manitoba producers who have gone through some of the toughest seasons these past two years. One of the worst droughts in Manitoba history, and now our producers are facing overland flooding and excess moisture on their fields, which inhibits their ability to seed. I want to thank all the producers who, despite of these hardships, plus a worldwide pandemic, continue to work tirelessly each and every day to provide food for Manitobans and consumers around the world. Each week, the Department of Agriculture releases a crop report to keep Manitobans informed on how much seeding of each crop has been completed. Seeding progression of annual field crops reported in the Department's weekly crop and weather report today will indicate that seeding is 36 to 40 percent complete compared to a five-year average of 92 percent. The profitability of the yield is reduced for all crops. Uh, each week seeding is delayed because of excess moisture. The excess moisture insurance feature of our agri-insurance program provides coverages for Manitoba crop producers who are unable to seed land because of excess moisture and flooding. In years past, where excess moisture was as severe as we see it today, insurance payments issued to producers were between 22 and $23 million. Some historical instances, we have seen as much as $162 million paid out in a single year. While it's too early to estimate the insurance payments for this season, the Department of Agriculture will keep the House and producers updated, and producers can expect to see these payments starting in June and hopefully wrapping up in August. On that note, I want to thank the Department of Agriculture for their outstanding efforts to ensure they are available to help producers in their times of need. Recognizing the difficulty faced by producers, the AgriStability Program application deadline has been extended to June 30th to ensure, ensure all producers have sufficient time to file for their programs. Manitoba Agriculture will continue to monitor the situation and update the crop weather forecast each week. I want to remind all producers that are we, we are here to support you through this difficult time. I also want to remind all producers of the farm and rural stress line as well as the new Manitoba Farmers Wellness Program introduced in January of this year, which offers free counseling services to farmers and their families while they navigate through these extremely difficult times. Madam Speaker, I ask my colleagues in joining me in thanking and applauding our Manitoba producers for their tireless efforts to feed not just Manitobans, but people around the globe through these difficult conditions. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well member for Burroughs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We've heard from the producers who say they are struggling. The last few years have been challenging for many with a significant drought. Many producers have left the industry, and now too much rain has come. Even in areas in which flooding has gone down, the soil remains so saturated that it can be impossible to seed. The weekly crop report shows that the seeding effort has been slow. Producers are looking for drier fields and switching their intended planting order. Producers are also changing what they intend to plant to account for the delay. Some farmers to switch a small amount of planned corn or soybean acres into canola and spring wheat, while planned field pea acres have dropped in some parts of the southwest in favor of more canola. According to the latest crop report, no part of agro-Manitoba 
has received less than 131% of normal rainfall for the period of April 12th to May 22nd. While large parts of central and eastern Manitoba have had over 260% of normal rain during that time. And as we can see, current conditions have only got better. Provincial seeding progress as of May 24th sits at an extremely low 10%, which is far behind the five-year average of 77% completion for this time of the year. Producers are especially worried about seeding deadlines for crop insurance. In extremely wet seasons, we have supported extension of seeding deadlines and do the same again here. The Manitoba NDP supports all attempts to help farmers fight excess moisture. We are committed to the concerns of producers. We remain committed to listening to the needs of the farmers in the weeks and months to come. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, Madam Speaker, I ask leave to speak to the Minister's statement. Does the Member have leave to respond to the Ministerial statement? Leave has been granted. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, Madam Speaker, uh, we are in a tough situation in Manitoba at the moment uh, with all the excess moisture and the crops being seeded later than usual. Uh, I think it's actually a pretty positive news that we've got 36 to 46 percent of the farmland seeded. Uh, it looked like it was uh, more than that. And uh, given the lateness of the spring, uh, I, I think that we need to look at the fact that there is uh, already a significant proportion of the seeding done. Uh, there is uh, time now, still till the uh, uh, June 20th ordinary date for crop insurance for seeding to be completed. Uh, I've called twice on the government to uh, make a, a decision to extend the crop insurance. I'm not sure if extending the paperwork also extends the planting date. If that's true, uh, that's uh, good. Uh, I've also called for looking at uh, cover crops, uh, whether that could be supported later on. I think we, we owe a special duty to farmers and to the world, indeed, to try and produce as much uh, grain as we can, uh, and that uh, extending the seeding is a positive thing because hopefully with climate change the fall will be extended as well. It is a tough situation. It's not time to panic, but it's a time to plan really well and do the best we can to support our farmers and to do everything we can to make sure that they are able, uh, where possible, to get their crops in, uh, even if in some cases it's late. Thank you. Further ministerial statements, the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, and I would indicate that the required 90 minutes notice prior to routine proceedings was provided in accordance with Rule 26, Bracket 2. Would the Honourable Minister please proceed with his statement? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, our Hydrologic Forecast Centre staff continued to monitor the precipitation system start, started yesterday and expected to continue throughout the day, Madam Speaker. This system has the potential to bring up to 75 millimetres over the next 48 hours. The City of Winnipeg received roughly 55 millimetres of rain last night, <clears throat> and the City of Morden received the most precipitation across the province with roughly 80 millimetres. Madam Speaker, the overland flooding warning is issued yesterday and shifted to include the western portion of the Red River Valley while remaining in the White Shell Lakes area and the Winnipeg River Basin. Depending on the amount and the intensity of the rain, water levels could rise rapidly and threaten low-lying and nearby properties, as well as roads, crossings, and other infrastructure, Madam Speaker. Please check with Manitoba 511 apt and most current road closures. The wind effects of warnings remains in the Manitoba lakes with the highest amount of wind set, set up expected to be in the larger lakes. North winds gusting up to 80 kilometers an hour per, per hour are, are expected. Winds may cause water levels at Lake Manitoba, Lake Winnipeg, Lake Winnipegosis, and Dauphin Lake to potentially rise more than five feet along the shoreline, Madam Speaker. The forecast wind is also expected to impact lakes in the White Shell Lakes region, and levels are expected to rise between one to two feet along these lakes, Madam Speaker. Daily meetings between Manitoba EMO and Manitoba Parks, Manitoba Hydro, and the Department of Natural Resources and Northern Development continue to discuss planning, coordinating resources, um, communication strategies, and next steps to um, priority of mitigation efforts on the White Shell areas, Madam Speaker. 
30 local authorities, three northern affair communities, eight First Nation communities, and one provincial park have declared state of local emergency. Indigenous Services Canada provides updates for First Nation communities providing the forecast precipitation and high wind events in collaboration with provincial staff, Madam Speaker. Yesterday, the community of Grand Rapids requested 15,000 sandbags. Our staff will work with ISC to fulfill these requests, Madam Speaker. A request of RM of Lakeshore has requested 1,000 super sandbags, with 10,000 sandbags was submitted yesterday. Our provincial staff will continue to work with local authorities to proactively mitigate high water concerns as we work through the latest precipitation and high wind events. As Manitoba is prepared to battle another significant weather system, I would like to remind ma members in this House and, and those who are listening that our government remains in a state of response and an ongoing flooding, Madam Speaker. However, if you have experienced damage due to flood impacts, I would encourage Manitobans to visit the Disaster Financial Assistance website to determine if their eligibility regarding compensation on uninsurable losses, Madam Speaker. As, as always, I would continue to recommend, command and highlight our amazing provincial staff and their tireless efforts. Manitobans across the province, my colleagues and I are deeply grateful, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Madam Speaker, once again, we thank the Minister for his update to the House and thank all of those emergency measures and Manitoba infrastructure staff who are continuing to work around the clock to uh, uh, mitigate the flooding around the province. Manitobans in all corners of the province are struggling with flooding and the subsequent issues that it has caused. The high uh, recent levels of precipitation and strong wind conditions are not helping as we deal with our sixth Colorado low this spring. On Twin Lakes Beach, waves are coming over the shoreline into people's properties as winds reach 85 kilometers per hour. St. Clements held an emergency council meeting this morning to prepare for the possible flooding in several of their communities. Dykes in Grand Marais are being tested and firefighters are on hand to help in case they're breached and residents need to evacuate. In the White Shell, business owners are feeling the impacts of flooding and the weather, like Ryan Kelly of Falcon Lake Meat and Grocery who notes that fewer customers are coming into the Falcon Lake Shopping Centre because of the cold and wet conditions, even though he's been fortunate enough to avoid flooding so far. Lori, the owner of the Mason Jar on West Hawk Lake, isn't quite as fortunate. Not only are fewer people visiting her boutique because they're busy fighting the flood and cleanup, but her own property has been damaged by the rising waters. She hopes that the government will announce funding for impacted residents like herself soon. In the southern part of our province, farmers are increasingly concerned about the impacted flood that is, it is having on our roads. Justin Friesen, a young farmer in the RM of Rhineland, says that they're, they've deteriorated so badly that full-on potholes have appeared in some of the gravel roads and the municipalities cannot keep up with the repairs. In Morden, more than 80 millimeters of rain in 24 hours has flooded basements in an already waterlogged area of our province. There is so much to do in this province to address the flooding and the weather, not just immediately today and tomorrow, but for the next month and likely for years to come in order to recover to where we are right now. Once again, we commend all those fighting the flood and thank the Minister for the continued updates to the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I seek leave to uh, respond to the Minister's statement. Does the member have leave to respond to the ministerial statement? Leave has been granted. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the Minister for his update. Uh, this is clearly a very serious situation for flood evacuees, uh, as well as for the First Nations municipalities, property owners and fam farmers who are all struggling with record rainfall and serious disruptions to their lives and livelihoods. Uh, it's clear from the province's flood map that while flooding in some communities is marked as peaked and many more, that's not the case. There are more than two dozen Manitoba communities where there is currently a flood warning in place and a storm surge has the capacity to do enormous damage on a number of lakes. We received a letter from the concerned residents of Lake Manitoba who were flooded 11 years ago and are very anxious about the current situation. They're hoping that once the storm has passed, once the flood has passed, a broad-based advisory group like the Lake Manitoba Advisory Board uh, could be restored 
uh, representation must come from affected parties, they say, farmers, ranchers, residential groups, environmental experts, and Indigenous leaders. Uh, since the House is set to rise tomorrow, I hope the Minister or his department will consider issuing bulletins by email to all members of the House until the floodwaters have receded. And we just wanted to highlight some of the challenges and vulnerabilities facing evacuees. The Winnipeg Free Press reported today about the measures that had to be taken by the federal government in another evacuation involving wildfires, essentially because predators, including drug dealers and sex traffickers, were waiting to prey on individuals who'd been evacuated. Uh, there were complaints more recently uh, when members of Pegasus First Nation were first evacuated that they arrived in uh, Winnipeg hotels and were mistreated. Uh, some were served undercooked food and disrespected by staff, which is clearly unacceptable in any circumstance and even more so when people are evacuees. Finally, I don't know, uh, just on a very lighter note, I don't know if there's a point in the Emergency Measures Act where the minister is obliged to start building an ark or to start separating the animals two by two, but we can all hope that it doesn't come to that. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Member statements, the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, oh, no, nope, the Honourable Minister of Sport, Culture and Heritage. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize some truly amazing instances of charity and goodwill that recently took place in the community of Lajemodier. On March 25th, I had the pleasure of visiting classes at Iron Lakes Community School, or ILCS, where Mrs. Nicole Molin's class was of particular interest, as they had not only done a lot of work regarding Ukraine awareness, but also had been preparing arts and crafts to sell in order to raise money for upcoming fundraisers. These events were being arranged in order to assist Ukrainians suffering from the terrible war taking place in their homeland as a result of the senseless Russian occupation. There was a total of three fundraisers initiated and run by students in support of Ukraine, with kindergarten students making and selling rainbow bracelets, grade five, six students running a craft, bake, and use book sale, and grade eight students volunteering and selling leftover items at Winokwa Community Center. Through private donations and funds accumulated by these fundraisers, a total of just under $4,700 was raised and donated to the Canadian Red Cross to support humanitarian aid in Ukraine. In addition, four students in grade eight raised over $1,400 for the UNICEF Children's Fund to help children impacted by the war. In all, over $6,700 was raised by, three, by these children and youth in hopes of making a difference for those affected by the horrors of war. In the gallery today, representing 150 students from ILCS who participated from kindergarten to grade eight in student-led initiatives to support Ukraine. We have with us Mr. Jordan Falconer, the principal of ILCS, and Mrs. Nicole Molin, a grade five, six teacher with a group of 15 students. It was a grade five student who organized and initiated the We Stand with Ukraine fundraiser that took place at Iron Lakes Community School on April 21st, 2022. And it was students from grade five, six, and eight who ran the For the People of Ukraine fundraiser that took place on April 30th, 2022 at Winaka Community Center. I ask all my colleagues to join me in recognizing the great work that these students have done for the people of Ukraine. Uh, the Honourable Minister for Sport, Culture and Heritage. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to ask leave to enter the names and the respective fundraising activities of the students in the gallery. Is there a leave to include that information in Hansard? Leave has been granted. The Honourable Member for Union Station. I rise today to speak about the importance of access to life-saving health care, particularly for trans and gender non-binary Manitobans. For many populations, access to health care has historically been and in many ways still is, marked with systemic and discriminatory barriers. For members of Manitoba's gender diverse community, accessing health services can often be an intimidated and complicated process. Gender affirming health care focuses on people's physical, mental, emotional, and social health needs and well being while confirming their gender identity. This care reduces the risk of suicide and increases positive mental health and the overall well being of individuals. Taking the steps to access care which affirms one's identities takes courage and should be met with compassion and a system which is ready to provide that care. 
Service providers should have stable and adequate funding and resources available to meet needs in a timely manner. Currently, the surgical and diagnostic backlog in Manitoba is barring some folks from even being placed on a waiting list for gender-affirming surgeries. Many people I've talked to are waiting with no idea as to when they might be able to access care at any stage of their gender-affirming process. Policies require extensive enhancements, and Manitoba's list of what is deemed medically necessary is incredibly restrictive. There is a significant role for the provincial government in not only addressing the backlogs, but also in combating stigma, upholding and enhancing human rights, and ensuring equitable access to all aspects of life-saving, gender-affirming health care. No longer should this government be one that gets in the way of trans and non-binary people living fully affirmed lives or one that treats their health care as an afterthought. We must do better by trans and non-binary non Manitobans across the province. The Manitoba NDP stands with all trans and non-binary communities and wishes all 2S LGBTQIA plus folks across Manitoba a very happy pride. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Environment, Climate and Parks. Madam Speaker, I rise in the House today to honour Mr. Jim Stinson, a resident of the RM of St. Clements, for his outstanding contributions to his community. Jim and his wife Darlene moved to the RM of St. Clements in 1990, while he was still employed with the RCMP and immediately became involved in his new community. When the province, when the, when the province began discussions regarding the expansion of the floodway, Jim researched the proposed expansion to ensure that the drinking water and the aquifer that supplies it would not be affected. It became very apparent that any further deepening of the center channel of the floodway would in fact endanger the groundwater due to many pre-existing breaches. Jim attended every meeting and fought to reduce the proposed depth. Madam Speaker, the expansion team sub subsequently conceded and agreed to Jim's proposal. In late 2000, Jim agreed to assist the municipality in their emergency preparedness program. This endeavor soon became a passion of Jim's to establish ways to protect residents in St. Clements and eventually became a full-time position as manager of protective services. There were many aspects in protecting the arm of St. Clements that required cooperation from many stakeholders, including council, the province, the capital region emergency coordinators, first responders, and staff with the municipality. Madam Speaker, in 2009, Jim received the Emergency Coordinator of the Year Award from the Disaster Management Conference. Madam Speaker, in 2010, Jim initiated a full-scale emergency exercise called Shooting Star. This included all municipalities within the Interlake and Eastman area. The exercise took over a year to develop and enable municipalities to respond to emergency situations such as a full-scale chemical spill. Madam Speaker, I ask my colleagues to join me today in acknowledging Mr. Jim Stenson for his outstanding contributions to the RM of St. Clements and the province of Manitoba. Member for St. James. Madam Speaker, exactly one year ago I published a CanStar article sounding the alarm about a crisis happening within the Grace Hospital emergency room and since then it's evident that things have only gotten worse under this PC government. Simply put, there's an emergency happening in our Grace Hospital ER and the PCs have done nothing to fix it. Doctors, nurses and healthcare support staff have been working tirelessly to provide the best care possible in this environment but it cannot be sustained. A few weeks ago, a community member reached out to me to let me know she'd taken her 73-year-old mother to the Grace ER with a serious head injury, but after waiting over 12 hours overnight without being seen by a doctor, she took her mum home and hoped for the best. Shameful. Other similarly horrifying stories have been shared with me in recent weeks, and the hard truth is that in West Winnipeg, residents can no longer be confident that they can access the emergency care they need when they need it. The Grace Hospital has been experiencing heavy patient loads ever since the PC government closed three out of six emergency rooms in Winnipeg. The closure of these ERs created a massive increase in the number of patients being routed to the Grace for emergency care, but this increase in patient volumes wasn't matched with an increase in available space or staffing. Patients have to be kept in the hallway because the emergency department, suited for 31 beds, is sometimes treating as many as 90 
patients at a time. Emergency care is a vital component of our health care system, Madam Speaker. Manitobans facing life-threatening emergencies need to be able to have timely and quality access to emergency services. I call on West Winnipeg MLAs and on the Minister of Health to take immediate action in response to this crisis. Manitobans deserve to be confident that they can access emergency medical services when they need them. It's time for this PC government to take serious action to solve the crisis taking place at the Grace Hospital emergency room. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we're about to break for summer, and I'd like to rise to express gratitude and pay tribute to some friends who've been lost in the last year. Uh, there have been many difficult losses throughout this pandemic, as well as some tough divisions, and I want to pay a, a brief tribute to Catherine Condra, Kay, who died this winter. Kay was a dear friend to my family. Uh, she was like a second aunt, really, a best friend to my mother, a gourmet cook with an acid tongue. She affected the lives of many as a teacher. She taught at Balmoral Hall. She also taught Indigenous students at Gordon Bell with enormous empathy and warmth. And she was an entrepreneur, a supporter and celebrator of the arts. Uh, she leaves behind Michael, Catherine and Jillian and their children and the members of a book club that has been all around almost as long as I've been alive. Uh, the other two losses are friends of mine. One is Sal Loxley, whose father John was a renowned economist at the U of M. Sal was a larger than life character who loved his city and his passing, which happened far too soon, has left a huge hole in the lives of his family, friends and community. The last is Megan Wolf. Uh, she was a mom, a teacher with a special spark of life. She was going to retire this year and sell her house and move to be with her partner in Colorado. But she died of COVID on Christmas Day. She's mourned by so many, by her identical twin sister, Jen, her partner, Andy, her children, Mia and Alex. And as you know, summing up, Kay was like an aunt or a second mother, Megan and Sal, I knew in high school and university. Um, and I knew them all at a time of life when you don't have a care in the world and you think you'll live forever. And I'm grateful for the time we had for them, uh, with them. At the same time, while this has been a year of many losses and challenges, there's always much to be grateful for and to look forward to. I want to thank the speaker, the clerk, our fellow members, and all the staff for all their work that makes our work possible. To graduates, whether it's from high school or university or college, who are moving on to a new phase in your life, best of luck. And finally, to everyone who hears this and everyone they love, I wish you peace, joy, and better days. I know they're ahead. I just don't know when. Thank you. Merci. Miigwech. Prior to oral questions, we have a number of guests here in the gallery, and I would like to introduce all of them to you. In the uh, public gallery, we have with us today two grade four classes from Greenway Elementary School, who are the guests of the Honorable Member for Wolseley. Also in the public gallery, we have with us Sandy and Zach Chosick of Bismarck, North Dakota, and Betty O'Lincoln of Winnipeg, who are the guests of the Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Also seated in the public gallery from Interlake Mennonite Fellowship School, we have 23 grade nine to 12 students under the direction of Byron Duick, and this group is located in the constituency of the Honorable Minister of Agriculture. And I'm also told that there are 19 guests in the public gallery from Ukraine, and they are <laughs> and they are here with their chaperone, former MLA Marianne Mahaychuk. And they also visited Interlake Gimli this past week. And a particular welcome to our members, but welcome to everybody that is here. Uh, we're uh, delighted that we can have our, our guests back and a very, very special uh, welcome to our friends from Ukraine. And now it's also time to say goodbye to two more pages. Prior to oral questions, um, I have this statement for the House. One of our pages, Divya Sharma, is serving her last day in the chamber today, and I wanted to share some comments that she has made 
with the house. Uh, Divya was honored to serve as Paige and learn all the personal beverage preferences of MLAs. <laughs> It was interesting to see the human side of politics and people in the chamber. She hopes to continue learning about these systems at the University of Manitoba and the political science program. Finally, she would like to say shukriya, megwitch, merci, and thank you to all the MLAs, her sergeants, Dave and Cam, the clerks, attendants, the security staff and custodians, and more for their input to democracy in Manitoba. Divya's mother, Neha, has joined us today as, and is in the public gallery. And another one of our pages, Taylor, is serving her last day in the chamber today, and I want to share some of her comments with you. She says, I really appreciated my time here at the legislature. Through this experience, I learned a lot and I am thankful for the opportunity and great privilege I have had for being here. I believe I grew a lot and I would like to thank everyone for their support and guidance. After I graduate this year from Miles McDonnell Collegiate and the International Baccalaureate Program, I plan to study history and anthropology at the University of Winnipeg to prepare for a career in historical curation. Taylor's sister Avery and her father Kevin are joining us in the gallery today. And I know we all grow very fond of our pages and we just want to wish uh, both of these pages the very best in their future endeavors. Oral questions. <laughs> The Honourable Member for St. John's. Miigwech, Madam Speaker. Each day we learn more and more about the scandal around the construction of the City of Winnipeg's police headquarters. A judge has ruled the former CAO of the City of Winnipeg accepted a bribe as part of this co uh, construction project. Fact. And we are learning more and more about invoices for work not done or not completed. Manitobans expect answers to the questions they have about this project yes, that cost over $100 million. Will the Premier take action today and call a public inquiry into the City of Winnipeg's police headquarters project? Good question. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, Madam Speaker, the member knows that there are dozens, I believe, of civil, civil litigations that continue to work their way through the courts related to this matter. Recently, the CEO of the City of Winnipeg, uh, Michael Jack, said that the reality is, as litigation proceeds, we continue to make our way through literally millions of documents. So at each stage of these proceedings, we are learning more. Uh, launching a public inquiry has been seen in the past during um, litigation can actually stop that litigation from happening. I don't know why, when information is being brought forward, the member opposite would want to interrupt civil litigation. Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. John's on a supplementary Sorry. question. Well, actually, Winnipeg City Council, alongside Mayor Brian Bowman, are actually calling for a public inquiry. Yeah. They're calling on this government to do what's right and call a public inquiry. They all state a public inquiry would help not hinder their civil suits on this matter. It would compel people to answer questions and for documents to see the light of day. This is why an inquiry is so desperately needed to get to the bottom of a really atrocious scandal here. Will the Premier stop delaying, do what's right and call a public inquiry into the police headquarters project today. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, the member opposite references the need to discover documents. Of course, that is what the discovery process and litigation is about. Michael Jacks, uh, the CEO of the City of Winnipeg, said the reality is, as litigation proceeds, we continue to make our way through literally millions of documents. So at each stage of these proceedings, we are learning more. We're getting more information from documents, the very thing that the member is asking for. The Honourable Member for St. John's on a final supplementary. Madam Speaker, there's nothing stopping the Premier from getting up today and calling a public inquiry into the police headquarters. She can do it right now. 
But unfortunately, Madam Speaker, this is a political decision on her part to refuse Winnipegers the accountability that they deserve on $100 million. On this side of the House, we stand with the Mayor of uh, Winnipeg, mm -hmm. who said an inquiry would help get to the bottom of this scandal. The government is just using the same excuses as Brian yep. Pallister. Will the Premier stop all the excuses, get up in the House today, and call a public inquiry into the police headquarters scandal? Miigwech. Yep. The Honourable Minister of Justice. In fact, there was uh, Derek Olson, a senior litigator and a former commission counsel for the Phoenix Sinclair Inquirer, who said actually that the preference would be to see civil proceedings concluded before an inquiry is held to avoid possible inconsistencies or conflicting results which might influence either the civil proceedings or the inquiry. In fact, we've seen in the past, Madam Speaker, that where there's a public inquiry at the same time, it can actually spark another form of litigation that could stop uh, the civil litigation that's ongoing. There are accountability measures happening in civil litigation. There's more information coming forward. I don't know why the member opposite would want to stop that discovery from happening, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Union Station. Madam Speaker, health support staff in this province have been without a contract for many years. They deserve respect, but this PC government has simply not provided that. Far too many of these essential workers were left out of health care top-ups during this pandemic, and their service entirely left without the respect it deserves. It's long past time for a resolution. Will the minister ensure top-ups, and when will they establish a new contract for health support workers? The Honourable Minister for Labour, Consumer Protection and Government Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, this is intervention request number, I don't know, 20, somewhere along the road for, from the uh, members opposite. Certainly, uh, we are not the employer, Madam Speaker. Shared Health is the employer. They are in bargaining with that particular union and their representatives. There is no space for government to insert themselves in that collective bargaining process, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Union Station on a supplementary question. Ma Madam Speaker, on this side of the House, we will always stand up for workers in Manitoba. <laughs> it's been five years since this PC government started closing emergency rooms, Order. urging care centres and clinics across Manitoba. Shame. Their cuts have left our hospitals overloaded. Health support staff are doing more with less, and they've been without a contract for far too long. Their wages have been frozen, and they were cut out of top-up pay. It's time to show these workers the respect they deserve, Madam Speaker. Will the minister ensure COVID top-up pay for these workers and a new contract today? The Honourable Minister of Labour, Consumer Protection and Government Thank Services. You. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, request number 21, I think, is where we are for the opposition asking us as government to intervene in collective bargaining where there is no space to go for government to intervene, Madam Speaker. On one side, you have the employer, shared health. On the other side, you have the union representing the workers. In between, you have their professional negotiators. Yes. They negotiate, Madam Speaker. There's no place in there for the government to intervene. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Union Station on a final supplementary. Madam Speaker, inflation is now over 6%. This minister and his government had no problem interfering and freezing the workers' wages for years, yeah. Yeah. Madam Speaker. Yeah. When these workers put themselves at risk working with patients infected with COVID-19, it's time for a fair deal for these health support workers all across our province, Madam Speaker. They deserve new, they deserve new contracts. They deserve top-ups that recognize their work during this pandemic on the front lines. Will the minister ensure that that funding is in place for those workers today? The Honourable Minister of Labour, Consumer Protection and Government Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, a flip-flop in the same question, Madam Speaker. 
blaming the government for intervening, asking us to intervene, but not intervene. So which is it, Madam Speaker? I, I can't see what path the member opposite is looking for. The, obviously, the members opposite don't want to listen to the answer. They are heckling me down, Madam Speaker. You can hear them do it, Madam Order. Speaker. There is no space for the government to intervene in this process. The shared health is the employer. They are in bargaining with the union, Madam Speaker. That is where this will come to fruition. Collect collective bargaining works. Before everything goes off track here, we have a lot of guests in the gallery and a lot of students. And I'm going to ask for everybody's cooperation today to please uh, listen carefully to the answers, listen carefully to the questions. And I don't think this is a very good time to be heckling when you are all role models here for future leaders. So I'm going to ask for everybody to please show respect to each other as uh, democracy unfolds. The Honourable Member for St. James. Madam Speaker, Bill 36 guarantees that Manitobans will pay more for their hydro bills. It takes all rate-setting power away from the Public Utilities Board and places that power into the hands of Cabinet. The pub is there to make sure the PC government can't force through rate hikes for political purposes. That's why Bill 36 is so wrong. Manitobans are speaking out, and we're joined today by concerned citizens from the Protect the Pub Coalition, who I invite to stand up, made up from representatives from a variety of community groups and organizations who are raising their voices against this bill. Will the government listen to these Manitobans who are calling for the PCs to withdraw Bill 36 today? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I welcome the guests to the gallery because it allows us the opportunity to correct the, the record where that member is clearly misleading people. We know that Bill 36 contains powerful provisions to protect Manitobans against increases. It regulates increases. It caps a maximum increase. Uh, it is either CPI or uh, rate, rate of inflation or 5 percent, whichever is the lower. This keeps the affordability advantage for right. all Manitobans. Tobins, that's what Bill 36 does. The Honourable Member for St. James on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, Manitobans like those who've joined us here today are speaking, on, speaking up because they're concerned about this government's plans to interfere with hydro and to undermine the pub. That means higher hydro bills for families and businesses, and it undermines independent oversight over rate setting. That's wrong. The pub already stopped higher hydro rate hikes sought by this government. That's why we should support the pub's independence instead of undermining it. Bill 36 goes in the wrong direction by undermining the pub. Will the minister listen to Manitobans and withdraw Bill 36 today? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, the member is just wrong. He uses language like rate increases sought by government, but he knows full well that in this province it is the regulator who sets hydro rate increases, not the government of Manitoba. Right. The role of the regulator is clearly defined in this bill to protect Manitobans against debacles like a dam in the future going $4 billion over budget. Madam Speaker, this bill is designed to protect Manitoba low rates while it stabilizes hydro, which is in all of our advantage. Yeah. The Honourable Member for St. James on a final supplementary. Madam Speaker, the costs of living are going up. The costs of groceries are going up. The costs of gas are going up. And if this government has their way, the costs of hydro are going to go way up. Instead of rates being set by an independent public body, like the Public Utilities Board, the PC Bill 36 means Manitobans could be forced to pay rate hikes as high as 5% per year. That's not right. It costs Manitobans money, and it undermines the independence of the pub. The government should back off of its plans to undermine the Public Utilities Board. Will the government listen to concerned Manitobans, withdraw Bill 36, and commit to filing a general rate application to the pub this year?
The Honorable Minister of Finance. Well, Madam Speaker, what we see is that the NDP is in a tight spot. It was less than a week ago that they argued that Manitobans should not have tax rebates in the form of the education property tax rebates, which we finally passed last week. And today he's taking a different tone. The fact of the matter is that costs are going up. And that is why this bill protects Manitobans from hydro rate increases right. beyond 5 percent. But I remind that member, it was also only about two weeks ago that the Free Press wrote about that member and the NDP strategy. It's either bad strategy, bad messaging, or just cynical politics, but they're trying Order. to mislead Manitobans. Manitobans will not be misled by the NDP. I just stand here for a while if I have to. I'm going to ask again for everybody to please, uh, when we've got especially students in the gallery and members of the Ukrainian community from Ukraine, I think a, a better display of democracy here is certainly called for. The Honourable Member for Fort Garry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to wish our Ukrainian friends with time off sea to the Manitoba Legislature. Every year, the government hides important financial information from Manitobans. And just like Brian Pallister, the Stephenson government has stripped important information from the estimate books. And just like Brian Pallister, the Stephenson government has failed to introduce an important budget bill to the House this spring. The House is scheduled to rise tomorrow. We think Manitobans deserve to know what the PC's plans are. Will the Finance Minister present his bits of bill to Manitobans before the House rises? Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, Madam Speaker, it seems that the member for Fort Gary has had his benching removed by his leader. Uh, I think that we haven't had a question for finance in two weeks after his disastrous performance on trying to suggest that triple net doesn't exist Order. to give businesses back their tax credit. And after that, he embarrassed himself and damaged his credibility when he took pot shots at the Premier of Manitoba for standing next to the Deputy Prime Minister to welcome Ukrainians to Canada. It is never too late to say you're sorry. It is never too late to set the record straight. Will he do it today? The Honourable Member for Fort Gary on a supplementary question. The Ukrainian community in Manitoba deserves more than empty flag waving from this government. They deserve real action on Ukraine. Now, BITSA is an important bill Manitobans deserve to see. It contains all the fee increases for things like park passes and other licenses the PCs hide in their budget. It contains hidden measures that can impact the finances of regular people. The PCs have had months to prepare their budget bill for Manitobans to see. It's about transparency and accountability. This is Manitobans' money. Will the minister introduce the bits of bill before the House rises tomorrow? Right on, Mark. The uh, Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, it saddens me to have to answer that question, but I am pleased to correct the record and define what the member actually means by flag waving, empty flag waving. This government has provided money for health care, for mental health, for accommodations, for EIA type of portable benefits. We have created a welcoming centre that is the envy of Canada that officials told the Premier less than a week ago should be the model by which all provinces operate to welcome Ukrainians. Our arms are open. Our hearts are open to Ukrainians. That member has an opportunity today to apologize for his shameful conduct and set the record straight. The 
the Honourable Member for Fort Gary on a final supplementary. The government has revised its budget twice now. They have stripped important information from the estimates book and they have now failed to present their budget bill to the House yet again. Manitobans deserve to know how the government will raise fees on them this year and how they'll spend their money. The PCs should stop hiding their plans and be open and accountable to this House. Will the minister stop uh, hiding bits at and present it to the House immediately? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, the criticisms of the member are completely baseless and without form. He knows that the supplementary for information for legislative review is more expansive than ever before. It is. It includes information by sub-appropriations. It includes information about FTEs by sub-appropriation. There is every manner and form of information that used to be there. So I don't know what you're arguing about. But more importantly, instead of trying to yell down my response, the member could have used this opportunity to apologize yeah. for his shameful conduct and his comments about Ukraine while the yeah. Consul General was in our midst one week yeah. ago. Yeah. Will he do it today? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Point Douglas. Miigwech, Madam Speaker. Housing is a human right, and all Manitobans should have access to safe, affordable quality housing. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like this PC government agrees. They continue to sell off hundreds of Manitoba housing units, even as the wait list grows from 1,699 in 2017 to over 6,000 in 2021. And other complexes are just sitting empty this, despite the urgent need. There's hundreds of people who are homeless in this province. Why has this Minister of Family sold off hundreds of Manitoba housing units despite the increase in demand for affordable housing while people are using encampments and bus shelters as housing? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And our government is committed to ensuring that all Manitobans have a safe, affordable place to call home. That is why we have built 745 new units of social housing at a cost of $110 million since we formed government. That is why this year, in this year's budget, $138.7 million towards providing um, all low and moderate income Manitobans a place to call home, yep. something that member voted against. Yep. I'd also like to remind the member that the wait list for Manitoba housing was nearly double under their watch. And I'd also like to remind the member that it was their government that kicked 26% of all applicants off the wait list because they didn't meet the criteria. Yep. That is their record. We are committed to getting housing for all Manitobans. Here, here. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Point Douglas on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, 1,699 people in 2017 to over 6,000 in 2021, and this government is saying that they're building enough housing for Manitobans? Obviously not when you have that many people waiting. When this government isn't selling off Manitoba housing units, they're failing to maintain them. Maintenance, cleanliness, safety has declined in Manitoba housing since this government took government. There is no surprise considering they cut the maintenance budget from $120 million to $31.4 million last year. That's over half, actually a quarter of what it used to be. Bug infestations, vandalism, safety concerns have become rampant in some of these complexes. The minister can address these concerns by committing the to adequate housing investment. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I'd also like to remind the members opposite oh. that our government has committed $154 million to providing, through the Canada Manitoba Housing Benefit, to providing top ups. These are for, for uh, youth that are aging out of care who are in uh, rental markets. We're giving them a $250 a month shelter benefit. We're also giving that to people who are experiencing uh, mental health and addictions, and we're also providing that benefit to people who have been precariously housed. We have also uh, been one of the fir for first time in the province of Manitoba introduced um, proactive measures to help prevent homelessness by introducing a rent bank, something that government, ne or that NDP party never did. Never we have did. prevented nearly 400 people from entering homelessness because of this proactive right. approach that this government is taking. Here, here. The 
the Honourable Member for Point Douglas on a final supplementary. Which, Madam Speaker, Manitobans are struggling with increasingly high costs of living. They're struggling with higher hydro bills because of this government, a, fit, a pitiful minimum wage because of this government, and an expensive housing market that this government continues to uh, give above market uh, okays to. Demand for the higher than ever affordable housing, yet this government is actively selling off Manitobans. While we have people living in encampments, living in bus shelters, right. they keep opening shelters, which isn't sustainable housing. This is a legacy of this government and this family's minister, but it doesn't have to be. This family's minister can invest, she could reverse course. Will she do so today and make sure that Manitobans are housed so that they don't have to live in encampments? and build more shelters the member's time and has expired. Shelter. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd also like to thank the nearly 400 Manitobans who worked with us at collaborating our uh, homelessness strategy. And I'd also like to thank the more than 100 people with lived experience for sharing their story with us as we were going through the province to talk to individuals about um, uh, what, what we need to do to ensure that all Manitobans have a safe and affordable place to call home. We recognize that the challenge is complex, and I'm very pleased to be working with other levels of government as well as many community partners at addressing the homelessness uh, crisis as well as the housing challenges in the province of Manitoba so that all Manitobans can have a safe, affordable access to uh, to a place to call home. That is something that this government is committed to, something that government never addressed. Yeah. I'm going to have to call the, minister, the member for Point Douglas to order, please. The Honourable Member for Burroughs. Yakuyu, my Ukrainian friends, for your visit to the gallery today. <laughs> Madam Speaker, 2,000 hogs suffocated at a barn on April 24th this year. We've heard these hogs died after a storm caused the barn to lose power and the backup generator failed. It's important to investigate what went wrong to ensure that actions are taken so that this doesn't happen again. Can the minister tell us whether an investigation by the provincial veterinarian has been requested? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm sure the uh, member opposite should be aware that every farm that houses animals of that size has to have an action plan, including a backup generator. And uh, that generator failed in the process, and sadly, uh, there were some animals that passed away. These uh, future uh, barns will have a supply uh, on hand as part of their uh, emergency measures plan, Madam here, Speaker. Here. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Burroughs on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Not enough details have been disclosed on how 2,000 hogs suffocated. It's important that we know what happened so that actions can be taken to prevent unnecessary loss of animal life. The minister should ask the provincial veterinarian to request an investigation to assure full transparency. As well, the province should disclose how many times a suffocation incident has occurred in the last five years. Can the minister provide us with a list of suffocation incidents and order an investigation? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank the uh, member opposite for the question. I'll get that and, uh, to that in a second. But uh, our government is, is committed to making and creating an affordable climate for Manitobans, and this includes our farmers and farm families. And uh, that's why we're edu uh, phasing out the education property tax. That member opposite stood in that very place where he stood a moment ago, and he voted against the education Order. property tax rebate for farmers. farmers. We're here to support farmers this year, 37.5%. Next year, 50% rebate on the education property tax for farmers. That member voted against it. We support farmers. The 
Honorable Member for Burroughs on a final supplement. Thank please. you, Madam Speaker. The Ag Minister is acting like Finance Minister. I should remind him that he is Ag Minister. <laughs> Manitobans want to know that wild stock Order. is not experiencing undue suffering. 2,000 hogs suffocating should warrant an investigation into the events that caused this tragedy. Preventative actions should be taken to ensure this can't happen again. And the government should disclose how many suffocation incidents have occurred in the past five years. Will the minister order an investigation and release this information today? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I'll get to that answer in a second. But uh, this very this very spring, the it. member was excited to sit down with Rachel Notley and learn from her. So we will take no lessons from a critic who would embrace a former Premier of Al Al Alberta and their regressive attacks on farm families. Shame. Our government respects the family farms and wants to give them the support <clears throat> needed not just to survive, but to thrive, Madam Speaker. This is a commitment we are dedicated Order. to, and we will remain dedicated to for years to come. If the critic opposite would like to continue supporting Order. both the family farm, they will remain in opposition for many years yeah, to come. Yeah. This government Remember stands time with producers. Has expired. Yeah. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Madam Speaker, on May 18th, Manitoba courts ruled that between 2006 and 2019, the Manitoba government systematically and repeatedly violated the constitutional rights of First Nations children who'd been taken from their families. In opposition, the PCs called it illegal and the NDP called it stealing, but what was happening was that thousands of First Nations children weren't just taken from their families, but all of their federal benefits were clawed back. Neither stealing nor immoral captures the astonishing and lasting damage to children, families, and communities that this practice has inflicted. I table a letter from the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs seeking assurances that this decision will not be appealed. Manitoba Liberals stand with AMC. Will the Premier accept the court's ruling and return the money to affected First Nations children? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And as I, I previously said, we thank Justice Edmonds for his 95-page ruling. It is a very substantial ruling, and our departments are reviewing uh, his decision, and we look forward to working with all uh, First Nations uh, partners in a new era of reconciliation and uh, working with them in transformation of the CFS system. I'd also like to remind members opposite that his uh, voice would have been very much beneficial when his government in Ottawa was appealing um, a ruling that was discriminatory towards Indigenous children in care. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface on a supplementary question. I'll remind the Minister it's not my government and I did speak up against it. The first five of 94 recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission are dedicated to children Order. in care. And that is because the practice of tearing apart Indigenous families has never stopped. The trauma is not just intergenerational, it is being inflicted right now. And in the last 10 years, there have been more Indigenous children in the custody of CFS than at the peak of residential schools. Hundreds and hundreds of tragic stories in Manitoba alone. It shouldn't take a constitutional lawyer to know that it's wrong to steal from First Nations children in care. The Premier knows this file because they were Minister of Families and voted with every other PC MLA to keep the money and absolve themselves of responsibility. Will the government do the right thing and reverse the decision and return what is owed to, Man to First the Nations The member's children time has expired. Law? The Honourable Minister of Families. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And it is a rare point of agreement between myself and, and that particular member of this House when we can all agree that we do need to usher in a new era of child welfare. That is something that this government has been committed to. That is why we have seen an 8 per cent reduction in children in care uh, since we formed office. That is why our Premier, who was then Families Minister, reversed the discriminatory policy of issuing birth right. alerts uh, for babies and reducing the apprehension. I would like to update the House that we have reduced uh, child uh, apprehensions 
uh, childbirth apprehensions by 75% since that policy was implemented. We know that there has been a lot of damage done uh, stemming back decades, and we know that we are all needing to be partners in ushering in a new era of child welfare transformation for the sake of all children in the province of Manitoba. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Provinces with primarily hydroelectric power are most effective in reducing emissions with electric vehicles. BC and Quebec have realized this with 17.1% and 13.6% respectively of new purchased vehicles being electric. That's why it's so disappointing that Manitoba is only at 2.4% of new electric vehicles being purchased. And I table a report that demonstrates this right now. Why is Manitoba so far behind other provinces on meaningful climate change initiatives, and what is this government going to do to promote the use of electric vehicles? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Climate and Parks. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I certainly appreciate the question from the member. And uh, we are looking very forward to working with the federal government, particularly on moving forward with uh, funding models to ensure that we can start to move faster, Madam Speaker. We know 2030 is just around the corner. 2050 will be here before we know it. We know there's a lot of work to do, Madam, Madam Speaker, in this space. We are committed to it as a government. We will be, we'll be moving forward with our plans. And I offer that member to come and sit with us so we can work in a part Partisan way, nonpartisan way, to ensure we can move forward with electric vehicles right here in Manitoba. The Honourable Member from McPhillips. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Manitoba has been leading the country in support of Ukrainian refugees. We are proud to be the first city to receive a charter flight of refugees here in Canada. The federal government is allowing Ukrainians to get necessary medical checkups done within 90 days of landing as opposed to prior to arrival. Can the minister explain how this process is assisting Manitoba in providing the necessary supports for Ukrainian refugees here? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I also want to thank my colleague, the member for Mick Phillips, for the question. He will be happy to hear that as of Friday, we are waiving the fees associated with these tests to ensure that everyone has access to them as they arrive in Manitoba. We hope to see other provinces following our lead so that we can all ensure Ukrainians arriving in Canada can get the tests necessary for certain work permits. We're also calling on the federal government to expand who they allow to do these tests, as currently only four doctors in Brandon, two in Winkler, and 14 in Winnipeg are authorized. Our government remains committed to supporting Ukrainians fleeing war and ensuring they have safe haven here in friendly Manitoba. Here, here, Thank here. you. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Madam Speaker, almost 5,900 Manitobans have now signed a petition uh, calling for improvements to Highway 6. They know that Highway 6 is an essential link to the north, but they also know that it is disproportionately dangerous for those that need to travel it every single day. They're simply asking for a commitment from this government to make improvements necessary to make Highway 6 safer. Will the minister commit to making these improvements to Highway 6 beginning this year? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to thank the member for the question. Ma Madam Speaker, Actually, my, my, my staff and I are actually going to go up to Thompson after this session's over to actually go and drive on Highway 6. We actually met with the group of Highway 6 group that actually talked about the issues of Highway 6. And Madam Speaker, our government is committed to investing in, in infrastructure, especially when it comes to Highway 6. We're going to be doing $9 million this year alone, about $53 million for the next three years when our three-year budget, Madam Speaker. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Concordia on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, the group organizing to make Highway 6 safer is made up of those Manitobans who have to travel on Highway 6 every single day. Our caucus was pleased to meet with those folks when they were here in person. 
when they traveled to give the minister that petition and to advocate for their simple asks of this government. They're asking for real improvements like wider shoulders, flatter shoulders, better snow plowing, more turnoffs, and more passing lanes. They want action now. They recognize that our, our construction season is quickly slipping away if this government doesn't act now. So once again, I'll ask the minister, will he take action now and start making improvements to Highway 6? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Madam Speaker, I'm not going to take any lessons from this member who was actually with the government, the NDP government back in the six, 17 years of government, Madam Speaker. Order. The Madam Speaker, this when he was in government, they actually underspent by, by millions of dollars, Madam Speaker. In 2013, they, they uh, underspent by $126 million. 2014, by $140 million. In 2015, by $160 million, oh, and in 200, 2016, by $174 million, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, they actually declared to invest in highways in rural Manitoba. Where, when you talk about safety in highways, Madam Speaker, we're going to do it right. Here, 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 here. The Honourable Member for Concordia on a final supplementary. Madam Speaker, this minister knows right now his government is underspending every single year that they've been in government on their infrastructure budget. And specifically, Highway 6, when residents have come and are simply asking for the basics, for uh, better snow plowing, for wider shoulders, for bathrooms, for garbage facilities, these are simple asks that the minister could take action on today. And yet, year after year, his government underspends his own budget and continues to come into this House and try to make this a political issue. These members, these people from Thompson are asking for the minister to act now. Will he take their advice and get to work right away? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Madam Speaker, I'm going to not take any lessons from this member opposite. You know, he was, when he was in government, again, they underspent way more um, in, in when it comes to infrastructure. And when it comes, Madam Speaker, we're going to invest into Highway 6. We're going to be actually, actually continuing uh, widening shoulders like we have always been doing. We'll continue investing in the north. We'll continue. We have some. We have some great opportunities in the north that we're going to be announcing after this blackout, and um, I'm looking forward to pre presenting that to the citizens of Thompson. Here, here, here. here. The time for oral questions has expired. Petitions. The honourable member for Transcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly in Manitoba. The background of this petition is as follows. The Bibliothèque Régionale Jolie Regional Library has been served Order. by the Red River Valley School Division to vacate the premises currently situated in the auditorium of Ecole Heritage School by March 31st, 2023. Number two. The auditorium was originally built in the 1960s by renowned Manitoba architect Etienne Gabary and has been home to the JRL for 48 years. Number three, a photo of the auditorium captioned the regional library is published in the 2008 document titled Heritage Buildings of the RM of the Salaberry and St. Pierre Jolie. It is marked as an important modern building that could attain the status of heritage site. Number four, the JRL and Red River Valley School Division have flourished from a mutually beneficial memorandum of understanding for 54 years. Number five, their shared collection boasts over 50,000 books and has the fourth largest collection of French language literature in rural Manitoba. Number six, the students that are bused in from neighboring municipalities that do not have a public library, such as Niverville, Grenfell, Kleefeld, are provided with free access to the public library and its fourth largest collection of French language books in rural Manitoba. We petition the Legislative Assembly in Manitoba as follows. Number one, to request the Minister of Labour, Consumer Protection and Government Services to consider granting the auditorium 
to the JRL by March 1st, 2023. Number two, to request the Minister of Education to recognize the value that JRL provides to the student population of EHS, as well as the communities of the village, the St. Pierre Jolie, and the RM of the Salaberry. Number three, to request the Minister of Education and the Minister of Francophone Affairs to recognize that the that a memorandum of understanding between the Red River Valley School Division and the JRL is mutually, financially, and culturally beneficial. Number four, to request the Minister of Sport, Culture, and Heritage to recognize the heritage potential of this important building and its status in the community. And number five, to request the Minister of Sport, Culture, and Heritage to prevent any renovations to the auditorium that would destroy and devalue the architectural integrity of the building. This petition is signed by Nadine Bouchard, Selena Breton, and Jonathan Shand, as well as many other Manitobans. Thank you. In accordance with our Rule 132, bracket 6, when petitions are read, they are deemed to be received by the House. The Honourable Member for Burroughs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. To the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba, the background to this petition is as follows. The population of those aged 55 plus has grown to approximately 2,500 in the city of Thompson. A large percentage of people in this age group require necessary medical foot care and treatment. A large percentage of those who are elderly and or diabetic are also living on low incomes. The Northern Regional Health Authority previously provided essential medical foot care services to seniors and those living with diabetes until 2019, then subsequently cut the program after the last two nurses filling those positions retired. The number of seniors and those with diabetes has only continued to grow in Thompson and surrounding areas. There is no adequate medical care available in the city and region where as the city of Winnipeg has 14 medical foot care centers. The implications of inadequate or lack of podiatric care can lead to amputations. The city of Thompson also serves as a regional health care service provider and the need for foot care extends beyond just those served in the capital city of the province. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows to urge the provincial government to provide the services of two nurses to restore essential medical foot care treatment to the city of Thompson effective April 1st, 2022. This has been signed by many, many comments. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Elmwood. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. Number one, the spike in catalytic converter thefts continues across North America and continues to affect Manitobans. Number two, Organized groups of criminals are climbing under vehicles and cutting catalytic converters, selling them to scrap metal recyclers for cash without any record of these transactions. Number three, the price of precious metals in catalytic converters like rhodium, palladium, and platinum are worth thousands of dollars an ounce. Scrap metal recyclers have catalytic converters priced to the vehicle with some catalytic converters worth $800. Number four, catalytic converter thefts have a total cost of $2,000 for each replacement. Manitoba Public Insurance charges a betterment fee for new replacements, so insurance doesn't cover the full cost. Number five, currently, sellers of catalytic converters do not have to provide government-issued photo ID, and recyclers do not need to record and retain the information or record details of the transaction. Number six, catalytic converters do not have any part number or vehicle identification number, VIN, and the inability to tie a catalytic converter to a specific vehicle is a major enforcement issue. Number seven, engraving of a vehicle's VIN on its catalytic converter would be a major deterrent to theft by tying the vehicle to the part and making enforcement possible. Number eight, provinces like BC and Alberta have scrap metal recycler legislation requiring businesses to keep proper records. 
We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows. Number one, to urge the provincial government to bring in consumer protection legislation requiring scrap metal recyclers to keep proper records for five years so only legitimate sales are allowed and criminals can be caught. Number two, to urge the provincial government to pass consumer protection legislation directing Manitoba Public Insurance to provide substantial discounts to auto on auto insurance premiums to Manitoba drivers for engraving vehicle identification numbers on their catalytic converters. And this petition is signed by many, many Manitobans. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Madame la Présidente, je désire présenter la pétition suivante à l'Assemblée législative. Le contexte de cette pétition est le suivant. Un, la Bibliothèque régionale Jolie Regional Library, GBRG, a été avisée par la Division scolaire Vallée de la Rivière Rouge, DSVRR, de libérer les locaux actuellement situés dans l'auditorium de l'École Héritage School, EHS, d'ici le 31 mars 2023. Deux, le auditorium a été construit dans les années 1960 par le célèbre architecte manitobain Étienne Gabory et BRG y est installé depuis 48 ans. 3. Une photo de l'auditorium intitulée La Bibliothèque régionale est publiée dans un document de 2008 intitulé Bâtiments patrimoniaux des MR de Salaberry et Saint-Pierre-Joli. Il est indiqué qu'il s'agit d'un bâtiment moderne important qui pourrait atteindre le statut de site patrimonial. 4. BRG et DSV RR ont prospéré grâce à un protocole d'entente mutuellement bénéfique pendant 54 ans. 5. Leur collection commune compte plus de 50 000 livres et possède la quatrième plus grande collection de littérature de langue française dans la région rurale du Manitoba. 6. Les élèves qui sont transportés par autobus des municipalités voisines qui n'ont pas de bibliothèque publique comme Neverville, Grenfell et Cleefield ont accès gratuitement à la bibliothèque publique et à sa quatrième plus grande collection de livres en français dans les régions rurales du Manitoba pendant l'année scolaire. Nous présentons à l'Assemblée législative du Manitoba la pétition suivante. 1. De demander au ministre du Travail de la protection de, des consommateurs et des services gouvernementaux d'envisager de concéder l'auditorium à la BRG d'ici le 1er mars 2023. 2. Demander au ministre de l'Éducation de reconnaître la valeur que la BRG apporte à la population étudiante de l'EHS ainsi qu'aux communautés du village de saint pierre joli et de la MR de Salaberry. 3. Demander au ministre de l'Éducation et au ministre des Affaires francophones de reconnaître qu'un protocole d'entente entre le RRVST et GRL est mutuellement bénéfique financièrement et culturellement. 4. Demander au ministre des Sports, de la Culture et du Patrimoine de reconnaître le potentiel patrimonial de cet important bâtiment et son statut au sein de la communauté. 5. Demander au ministre des Sports, de la Culture et du Patrimoine d'empêcher toute rénovation de l'auditorium qui détruirait et dévaloriserait l'intégrité architecturale du bâtiment. Cette pétition est signée par Colin Coulomb, Michaelia Laroche et Justice Guigui. Merci. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, Madam Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. One, a hearing aid is a battery-powered electronic device designed to improve an indi individual's ability to perceive sound. Worn in and behind a person's ear, they make sounds louder and helping people hear better when it's quiet and when it's noisy. People who suffer hearing loss, whether due to aging, illness, employment, or accident, not only lose the ability to communicate effectively with friends, family, or colleagues, 
They also can experience unemployment, social isolation, and struggles with mental health. Hearing loss can also impact the safety of an individual with hearing loss, as it affects the ability to hear cars coming, safety alarms, call 911, etc. A Global Commission on the State of Research for Dementia Care and Prevention released an updated consensus report in July 2020, identifying 12 key risk factors for dementia and cognitive decline. The strongest risk factor that was indicated was hearing loss. It was calculated that up to 8% of the total number of dementia cases could potentially be avoided with management of hearing loss. <coughs> Hearing aids are therefore essential to the mental health and well-being of Manitobans, especially to those at significant risk of dementia or Alzheimer's, a disorder of the brain affecting cognition in the ever-growing senior population. Audiologists are healthcare professionals who help patients decide which kind of hearing aid will work best for them, based on the type of hearing loss, patient's age, and ability to manage small devices lifestyle and ability to afford. The cost of hearing aids can be prohibitive to many Manitobans, depending on their income and circumstances. Hearing aids cost an average $995 to $4,000 per ear, and many professionals say the hearing aids only work at their best for five years. Manitoba residents under the age of 18 who require a hearing aid as prescribed by an otolaryngologist or audiologist, will receive either an 80% reimbursement from Manitoba Health of a fixed amount for an analog device up to a maximum of $500 per year or 80% of a fixed amount for a digital or analog programmable device up to a maximum of $1,800. However, this reimbursement is not available to Manitobans who need the device, who are over the age of 18, which will result in financial hardship for many young people entering the workforce, students, and families. In addition, seniors representing 14.3% of Manitoba's population are not eligible for reimbursement despite being the group most likely to need a hearing aid. Most insurance companies only provide a minimum partial cost of a hearing aid, and many Manitobans, especially retired persons, old age pensioners, and other low-income earners do not have access to health insurance plans. The province of Quebec's Hearing Devices Program covers all costs related to hearing aids and assistive listening devices, including the purchase, repair, and replacement. Alberta offers subsidies to all seniors 65 and over and low-income adults 18 to 64 once every five years. New Brunswick provides coverage for the per and maintenance not covered by other agencies or private health insurance plans, as well as assistance for those for whom the purchase would cause financial hardship. Manitobans over 18 are only eligible for support for hearing aids if they're receiving employment and income assistance, and the reimbursement only provides a maximum of $500 an year. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows to urge the provincial government to consider hearing loss as a medical treatment under Manitoba Health, to urge the provincial government to provide income-based coverage for hearing aids to all who need them, as hearing has been proven to be essential to Manitobans' cognitive, mental, and social health and well-being. Signed by Patrice Land, Beverly Frankfurt, Gary Bell, and many, many other Manitobans. Uh, the Honourable Member for Concordia. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. And the background to this petition is as follows. Number one, residents of the River Park South community in Winnipeg are disturbed by the increasing noise levels caused by traffic on the South Perimeter Highway. Number two, the South Perimeter Highway functions as a transport route for semi-trucks traveling across Canada, making the stretch of the perimeter especially loud. Number three, According to the South Perimeter Noise Study conducted in 2019, the traffic levels are expected to increase significantly over the next 20 years, and background backyard noise levels have already reached surpassed 65 decibels. Number four, Seniak Road, which runs alongside the South Perimeter, contributes additional truck traffic, causing increased noise and air pollution. Number five, 
Residents face a decade of construction on the south perimeter, making this an appropriate time to add noise mitigation for the south perimeter to these projects. Number six, the current barriers between the south perimeter highway and the homes of the River Park South residents are a berm and a wood fence, neither of which are effective at reducing traffic noise. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows. Number one, to urge the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure to consult with noise specialists and other experts to determine the most effective way to reduce the noise, traffic noise and to commit to meaningful action to address resident concern. And number two, to urge the Minister of Transportation to help address this issue with a noise barrier wall along the residential portions of the river of the south perimeter from St. Anne's Road to St. Mary's Road and for River Park South residents. And this petition, Madam Speaker, is signed by many Manitobans. The Honourable Member for Point Douglas. Thank which, Madam Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to the petition is as follows. Across the province, many Manitobans continue to struggle with addictions, and the pandemic has led to even more deaths and worsened the ongoing public health crisis of opioid overdoses. Two, 372 Manitobans died from an overdose in 2020, and that's over one a day and 80%, 87% higher than in 2019. Three, Manitoba is expected to exceed over 400 overdose deaths in 2021, but the data is not publicly available since the last public reporting of opioid deaths was published in 2019. Four, the data for drug overdose deaths from 2020 to 2021 was compiled through media inquiries and this, should, and this needs to change. Five, access to timely data on the harms of drugs helps to inform both government and stakeholders on where to take action and target resources needed in various communities. Six, Manitoba is the only province not providing regular, timely data to the federal government opioid information portal. Seven, Manitobans deserve a government that takes the growing drug crisis seriously and will report the data publicly in a timely matter, manner, matter to target actions and allow for accountability. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows. To urge the provincial government to enact Bill 217 the Fatalities Inquiries Amendment Act overdose deaths reporting to require the province to publish the number of drug overdose deaths as well as the type of drug on a government website in a timely fashion. This has been signed by Doug or Don Monkman, Christy Daniels, Giselle Morisot and many other Manitobans. The Honourable Member for St. Vitale. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba. To the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba, the background to this petition is as follows. One, the Bibliothèque Régionale Jolie Regional Library, JRL, has been served notice by the Red River Valley School Division, RRVSD, to vacate the premises currently situated in the auditorium of a coal heritage school, EHS, by March 31st, 2023. Two, the auditorium was originally built in the 1960s by renowned Manitoban architect Etienne Gabary, and it has been home to the JRL for over for 48 years. Three, a photo of the auditorium captioned the regional library is published in a 2008 document titled Heritage Building in RM de Salbury and St. Pierre Jolie. It is marked as an important modern building that could attain the status of a heritage site. Four, JRL and RRVSD have flourished from a mutually beneficial memorandum of understanding for 54 years. Five, their shared collection boasts over 50,000 books 
and has the fourth largest collection of French language literature in rural Manitoba. Six, students that are bused in from the neighboring municipalities that do not have a public library, such as Niverville, Grunthal, Kleefeld, are provided with free access to the public library and its fourth largest collection of French books in rural Manitoba during the school year. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows. One, to request the Minister of Labour, Consumer Protection and Government Services to consider granting the auditorium to the JRL by March 1st, 2023. Two, to request the Minister of Education to recognize the value that JRL provides to the student population of EHS, as well as the communities of Village de Saint-Pierre-Jolie uh, Saint and the RM de Salisbury. Three, to request the Minister of Education and the Minister of Francophone Affairs to recognize that an MOU between the RRVSD and JRL is mutually, financially, and culturally beneficial. Four, to request the Minister of Sport, Culture, and Heritage to recognize the heritage potential of this important building and its status in the community. Five, to request the Minister of Sport, Culture, and Heritage to prevent any renovations to the auditorium that would destroy and devalue the architectural integrity of the building. This petition has been signed by many Manitobans, including Christine Slobodian, Tristan Friesen, and Sean Kenyon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. John's. Madam Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. Um, the background to this petition is as follows. One, across the province, many Manitobans continue to struggle with addictions, and the pandemic has led to even more deaths and worsened the ongoing public health crisis, opioid uh, overdoses. Two, 372 Manitobans died of an overdose in 2020. That's over one a day and 87% 80, higher than in 2019. Three, Manitoba is expected to exceed over 400 overdose deaths in 2021, but the data is not publicly available since the last public reporting of opiate deaths was published in 2019. For the data for drug overdose deaths in, from 2020 and 2021 was compiled through media inquiries and this needs to change. Five, access to timely data on the harms of drugs helps inform both government and stakeholders <clears throat> on where to take action and target resources needed for various communities. Six, Manitoba is the only province not providing regular timely data to the federal government opioid uh, information portal. Seven, Manitobans deserve a government that takes the growing drug crisis seriously and will report the data publicly in a timely manner to target actions and allow for accountability. We petition the, Mani the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows, to urge the provincial government to enact Bill 17, the Fatality Inquiries Amendment Act, overdose death reporting, to require the province to publish the number of drug overdose, death, overdose deaths, as well as the type of drug on a government website in a timely fashion, signed by many Manitobans. Orders of the day, government business, the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I have two leave requests uh, relating to referring bills to the Committee of the Whole. Could you please canvas the House for leave one to waive uh, subrule 91 bracket 7 for Bill 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act, Bill 44, the Employment Standards Code Amendment Act, minimum wage, and Bill 234, the Drug Related Death Bereavement Day Act to allow them to be considered in Committee of the Whole today and two, to append any written submissions to the aforementioned bills to the end of today's House Hansard transcript 
provided they are received by 5 p.m. today. Is there leave one to waive sub rule 91 bracket seven for bill 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act, bill 44, the Employment Standards Code Amendment Act, minimum wage, and bill 234, the Drug Related Deaths Bereavement Day Act to allow them to be considered in committee of the whole today, and two, to append any written submissions to the aforementioned bills to the end of today's House Hansard transcript provided they are received by 5 p.m. today. Is there leave? Leave has been granted. The Honourable Government House. Uh, thank you. Could you uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Could you please call for a second reading debate, Bill Number 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act. It has been announced that the House will consider second reading of Bill 41, the Child and Family Service Amendment Act, this afternoon. The Honourable Minister of Families. I move, seconded by the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning, that Bill No. 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act, Loi modifiant la loi sur les services à les enfants et à la famille, be now read a second time and referred to a committee of this House. That's a good one. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Family, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning, that Bill Number 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Bill 41 amends the Child and Family Services Act as a key step towards the realization of Indigenous jurisdiction over child and family services. These amendments authorize information sharing with Indigenous governing bodies exercising jurisdiction to ensure the seamless transition of services from prov provincial CFS agencies to service providers operating under Indigenous laws. It also ensures the ongoing province-wide service coordination and the continued safety of children. Additional clarifications are included regarding information sharing and the child abuse registry use by provincially mandated agencies. Four key legislative themes highlight the most impactful changes introduced through these amendments. The first being that Indigenous governing bodies and their service providers will be authorized to access CFS information about their community members when they are planning or providing CFS services. This includes authorizing trustees or public bodies to share information with Indigenous service providers that may be protected under the Personal Health Information Act or the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act if it is necessary for the health, safety, and well-being of a child. Second, it authorizes an administrative service transfer process so that CFS cases can be transferred from provincially mandated CFS agencies to Indigenous service providers without engaging the provincial court. Third, it supports the continued use of the provincial electronic CFS information system by Indigenous service providers and authorizing the ability to refer individuals to the Child Abuse Registry. And fourth, it's protecting Indigenous service provider records when uploaded through the Provincial Electronic CFS Information System. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Indigenous governing bodies and their service providers must have access to CFS information so they can plan for the delivery of CFS in services to their community members. It is just as important that a process is legally enabled to transfer the service responsibility of four children and families currently supported by the provincial CFS system to service providers under Indigenous law. The authorization of this process will substantially reduce the financial and administrative burden for Indigenous service providers, provincially mandated agencies and the courts. Through these changes, our government is signaling the expectation that information should be shared to support Indigenous jurisdiction for child and family services. The province is currently engaged with several Indigenous governing bodies at various stages of exercising jurisdiction, with many more expected to come forward soon. Time is of the essence to proactively make these changes and support Indigenous jurisdiction for child and family services and the path to reconciliation. We recognize that this is only the first step of a longer journey and we expect to make many more changes as we hear and learn more about what is required to effectively support the realization of Indigenous jurisdiction of child and family services in Manitoba. I look forward to further discussions on Bill 41 and I would like to thank the, the 
support of everyone in this house for bringing this bill to a speedy second reading. I also want to thank the officials in my department for all the work that they've done. I'd like to thank all the Indigenous governing bodies who have consulted with us and worked with us as we've been walking down this journey hand in hand towards uh, the realization of this. And most importantly, I'd like to dedicate this bill to um, all children in the province of Manitoba and certainly hope that this is the start in creating a better future. For them. Thank you. A question. A question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the minister by any member in the following sequence. First question by the official opposition critic or designate. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized opposition parties. Subsequent questions asked by each independent member. Remaining questions asked by any opposition members and no question shall ex question or answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The member for DePauw, Kamisak. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Pegwas has taken on child and family services as recognized in federal Bill C-92. Can the minister explain how the province is currently dealing with the data sharing arrangements with Pegwas in advance of this legislation passing? The Honourable Minister of Families. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, and this uh, legislation is pertinent to pass, uh, and it is our hope that it receives a royal assent tomorrow, so then we can cha share information, anything that is in the provincial CFS information sharing database, or um, information database, and it, we would also be able to share information under the Child Abuse Registry with PEGWIS without a court order. This legislation paves the way for that process. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, uh, one of the concerns that has been raised about the information which is in the CFS database is that there's sometimes in the past been inadequate quality control and so that there are allegations put there uh, but there's no uh, assurance that those allegations are valid. Um, and I wonder what uh, process the minister is taken or has taken to make sure that the quality of the information in the records is uh, of high quality. The Honourable Minister of Families. So as the member opposite is aware, um, agencies and authorities are enabled under our legislation to access information and contribute to the sharing of information and the compilation of information. This bill is, certain, is just simply extending that same jurisdiction that a CFS agency and authority would have over to an Indigenous governing body um, so that they would be able to act as, a, as uh, an entity, um, an agency, if you will, um, into itself. And so all the rights and privileges that an agency has will be transferred to an Indigenous governing body. And it doesn't address the, the, the quality control of the data. The Honourable Member for DePaul Kamisak. <clears throat> this bill before us also provides for the transfer of supervision of care and guardianship to Indigenous governing bodies. How is this matter currently being handled for PEGWAS in advance of the legislation passing? PEGWAS. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, and I'd like to congratulate PEGWAS. They were the first in, in the province for um, bringing their own law into force at the end of January. And in fact, they, they're setting a precedent in the country because they're um, exercising jurisdiction for their children that are on and off reserve. Our uh, government and our my department officials have been working very closely with them. At the start of this year, what we did is we transferred the funds uh, specifically uh, allocated traditionally for PEGWIS uh, Child and Family Services under the Southern Authority. Instead of providing that, those funds to the Southern Authority for transfer to the CFS agency, we delivered those directly to um, the, the First Nation and we have been working very collaboratively to ensure the seamless transition uh, during this uh, Minister's time. time has expired. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, uh, I, I want to 
move further because this quality control issue is actually really, really important. I'm aware of instances where uh, people have fabricated information uh, as revenge to imply that uh, they were abusing and that children have been taken away based on false information. Uh, what should happen is that there should be a, a proper investigation of any allegations to, to determine whether they're factual or not. But that doesn't or hasn't always occurred in the past. So what measures is the minister taking to make sure that there is high quality of information if we're going to be sharing it and transferring it? The Honourable Minister of Families. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I can appreciate the member's uh, question about quality assurance and the role that government may play in um, the, the quality of the data that is kept in the CFSIS system or in the Child Abuse Registry. But what we're here to debate today is simply about um, expanding um, the, the, the parameters and supporting Indigenous governing bodies who are exercising jurisdiction over their children. And this is, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, if this would be the particular time to be uh, moving forward in the direction that members opposite is purporting. This is about working collaboratively uh, with the Indigenous leadership so that they can have a successful repatriation of their children in Manitoba. The member for DePaul Kamisak. Thank you. This bill makes it even more important that the CFAS database is kept up to date. What steps is the minister taking to improve that system? The Honourable Member of Minister of Families. Thank you. At this current moment, and the bill that we're debating right now is about facilitating um, the uh, Indigenous governing bodies' ability to exercise jurisdiction and to assume the successful repatriation of their children under the Federal Act respecting uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, youth and families. It is really important that we uh, move forward in empowering Indigenous governing bodies and work then collaboratively, whether it be with a provincial CFS, a provincially mandated CFS agency, or an Indigenous governing body, that the database that we all collectively share is of the highest information and, and integrity of information. And that is uh, definitely a possibility for future discussion. The honor okay. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, uh, I, we certainly support the sharing of information because we think this can be very helpful. But the first and foremost and most important item should be that that information is accurate that there are some quality standards there. Because if we're sharing information and it's not accurate, this is a huge problem. A and, and it's a problem that has occurred in the past and is a problem why some uh, uh, agencies are not as ready to participate in sharing as, uh, as perhaps we would like. I, I think this is really fundamental. And I'm disappointed that the minister is not going to do more in terms of quality control I would ask the minister if a person who's affected... The Honourable Member's time has expired. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, yes. Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'm very disappointed that this member may be suggesting that Indigenous governing bodies are not uh, to be provided the same uh, information and the same, given the same integrity that we would be giving another CFS agency. If I was in here creating another agency under the provincial mandate, would we be having this discussion? I would certainly hope that this member is not suggesting a different standard for Indigenous governing bodies exercising jurisdiction over child welfare. The the member for Kuwaitinuk. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I just wanted to ask the, the minister, is, will there be any funds available in the current funding model to help First Nation, First Nation agencies uh, update uh, their, the current systems they have for record keeping and record sharing? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and that is a great question. One of the things that we have done as a government is assured all Indigenous governing bodies who are moving forward in this process that we want to have a seamless transition and that all, all of the funding, the current funding levels that we have set today would be available to the Indigenous governing body. Um, and, and in regards to building capacity, there is a, a fund 
available that the federal government has made. This is their law that we're helping implement, and they did make a fund available for capacity building that the province is supporting. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, I, I want to assure the Minister that we're not uh, discriminating, but rather this request for quality records came directly from people in First Nations communities, right? Because they are concerned about false information getting into the wrong hands and causing trouble for people. Uh, will the Minister answer this question? That is, if a person who is affected by an allegation, um, is that person going to be able to be made aware that there is this accusation against them? And are they going to have an ability to appeal uh, that allegation so that uh, they can be assured that the information on them... The Honourable Member's adequate. time has expired. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate the clarification from the member opposite that he was not suggesting a different standard for Indigenous governing bodies exercising jurisdiction over child welfare. What I also will tell this member that I appreciate his concerns about the integrity of da data collected in the child welfare system as a whole, and that that is something that we will certainly address, that we can work with all of our partners to addressing. But I would also like to remind the member that this is a historic day. This is a historic piece of legislation legislation that we are, for the first time in the province's history, creating a, a pathway forward so that we can help Indigenous governing bodies repatriate their children after years and years and years of, um, of uh, a system that did not support families in the way uh, that would happen. The Honourable Minister's outcome. time has expired. The member for the Paw Kamisak. Thank you. I understand that this is all about transferring sharing information, but the key point of this legislation is the CFA system, and currently we're hearing that it's out of date, it needs current, probably needs funding to get it updated, and for all of our First Nations to get acquainted with this as well, so the CFA system is quite key, quite key to my message here. So what other Indigenous partners does the Minister anticipate will soon take authorities as recognized in federal Bill C-92. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And as I mentioned earlier, I've been very honoured to, um, to be a part of a uh, PEGWA ceremony that happened a few months back as they were the first in the province. There are many others. There are several applications that are um, before the federal government and the province to help um, uh, transfer um, indigenous government to transfer services over to the indigenous governing bodies and um, I could provide a list for uh, the member in the near future. The Honourable Member for River Heights. I, I want to thank the Minister for her efforts in bringing this forward but I, I really believe that we need a major effort to make sure that the uh, the database that is being transferred and the information therein is uh, yeah. of high quality, that there is ability to correct mistakes when there are false allegations made, uh, that this is, uh, I believe, really important if we're transferring data. I, I don't want to hold things up, but I, I think that uh, at the minimum, there needs to be a, a full review of how... The Honourable Member's time has expired. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And it is very important uh, that we pave the way for Indigenous governing bodies to work with their respective members in determining how it, their, this private information is managed within their system. There will be system-wide um, initiatives to ensure the integrity of the data. I, I agree with members opposite that the information, the confidential information that is kept in the, C, uh, the C, CFS information system is, is important. It's important that there's quality controls there, and it's certainly something that this government will address. The member for Kiwetanuk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'm just wondering about the, the perhaps the, the definition of Indigenous governing bodies. And currently, um, th there is some, some agencies, uh, Southeast Child and Family Service, for example, uh, DOCFS, 
And then there's also independence, like Pegwis had mentioned, as we mentioned earlier. So is, is there an opportunity in here for, to perhaps open that up so that other communities, as individual communities like Pegwis, for example, can come forward if they're already kind of associated with a, a current Child Family Services Agency? The Honourable Minister of Families. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm certainly happy to talk to the member and uh, provide a more fulsome um, opportunity, uh, fulsome answer than I have in these few minutes that we have here. But just so that he knows that there is a definition that we've outlined in the bill about what an Indigenous governing body is, and that means a council, government, or other entity that is authorized to act on behalf of the Indigenous group, community, or people that hold rights recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act. And I, if that doesn't fully answer the question, I'd be more than happy to spend some time um, clarifying and providing further information to the member. The member, the Honourable Member for River Heights. Yes, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we see and we will support this legislation, but we think it's really important that there be a full review after a year to look at any problems whether it's with quality or whether it's with how the system is working. Will you support a report stage amendment or a, a committee of the whole amendment, which we will bring forward to have that review in a year? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I can assure this House that there is much, much more work to be done. We are at the start of our journey. We are working with several Indigenous governing bodies throughout the entire province, and we are, uh, and they're all at varying stages of exercising jurisdiction for child and family services. We are at the beginning of a new era, and I can assure all members that in a year's time, in two years' time, in five years' time, the child welfare system in Manitoba will look nothing like it does today. Time for questions has expired. The floor is now open for debate. The member for DePaul Kamisak. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, it's always a privilege to stand here to put a few words on record, and such as uh, very important legislation as this, as many of you know. Uh, CFS legislation policies have been very, uh, very dearing into my family and my community, especially with Indigenous people. So it's quite honorable to stand here and uh, talk about this. So first of all, I want to put on record that we support this legislation and believe it is important to move forward quickly with it. And I'm proud of my community, uh, Peg West First Nation part of my constituency uh, with them moving, which I agree with the minister, which is indeed historic. Um, I believe OCN was on that, was on that uh, trail. I could have believed that we could have been our first, but chief and council re-election views change. So it's kind of concerning right there. So um, this change is welcome. But we got to talk about procedural matters that need to be addressed to ensure proper record keeping across systems as well as for arrangements for transfer of children across systems. So we all agree that this bill will provide information held by child and family services agencies to Indigenous governments and service providers choosing to take legislative authority over let children in care. The information being exchanged includes details about children, families receiving services, as well as personal health information and access to the child abuse registry. Bill 41 is a step to bring Manitoba in line with federal Bill C-290 Bill C-92 legislation, which recognizes First Nations, Inuit, and Métis authority over child welfare. Now the key point of this is the CFIS system. It's a case file database. Bill 41 will formally extend access to Manitoba CFS information system. However, this system, which is quite crucial within this legislation, is decades old computer system that tracks thousands of children in Manitoba, Manitoba's protection services that really needs to be improved. The current computer system was created 
1993. Has there been any discussions to update this system? Yeah. Because the provincial auditor general has said about this system, CFIS, that is, quote, out of date, not complete and not accurate. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is quite concerning with this legislation, especially if this information is coming straight from the Auditor General. And as we heard from members here and from myself, there is concerns, there is concerns coming from the First Nations communities too, and families such as mine. We affirm the rights of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people to exercise jurisdiction over CFS services. However, we also recognize that there is potential that more complexity may be added to an already complex system. That is why the CFES system needs to be improved. And this is key because even more so as the as system is extended to existing or new authorities and bodies. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we all want our children to grow up in safe and loving homes with the supports they need to get a good start and a good education. We want to see real action to reunify families and reduce the number of children in care. I've heard from many people in my constituents and people working within CFS agencies that the size of the files of children in care are much greater than one file tower with the reunification file systems. So that shows you that there is more work put into apprehending children than rather than reunification. Um, I myself have been just been granted the conversation to adopt my own two nieces after seven years. Tell me, where is unification in that? I've spoken to several ministers, I've spoken to several agencies, so my concern my own community, seven years to actually look at me to adopt my two nieces were we being separated. Okay? So, I just want to get on with why. Ah, oh, sorry. I'm getting a little bit clumped here. Okay. Let's talk about block funding here. The block funding mon model is detrimental towards the agency and it is clear that their ultimate goal is to reduce costs of all costs, reduce costs at the expense of children currently in care, reduce costs at the expense of children and families. So with my concern here is that with the uh, leadership from all levels, um, going into this process, how much is there going to be for the capacity building for other First Nations who do want to have their own agency? I've participated in community consultation in Opasquia Cree Nation regarding our own laws that we wanted to implement. And it was quite exciting for me to attend that, especially as family's critic, especially as somebody who has been within the system, the system has been in your home. They're like cockroaches, they never get out. And your file is there forever. And my concern is, is that um, within our own communities, um, what the member for River Heights was bringing up, how are we going to be protected too as well when it comes to false information? How is it going to be, how, we're, how, how is uh, MACY going to be tagged into here as well? And um, I also want to talk about uh, leadership as well. Um, with this legislation, I've expressed before that Will this include the children's voices as well? Which I find as a mother who's personally dealt with this, that the children's voices are missing. 
How is the province going to work with our First Nation communities rather than saying it's up to the First Nation communities? Because remember, we're Manitobans too, and I still want this dialogue to continue. That's what I'm worried about. Is this dialogue between the province and our children going to continue since it's going to be eventually transferred? So we're starting with PEGWIS. Let's get this right with PEGWIS to ensure that these concerns are addressed. I've heard from Mr. Ms. Ms. Pawastic, Grand Rapids. Ovid Mekrity was there talking about uh, their goal to reach this level where PEGWIS is at with the province and Bill C-92. But there's concerns from the community, legit concerns about privacy, about whether we're gonna be taken seriously from, by our own people you know, versus legislation, versus First Nation legislation. And I know that, I can say that as a former band counselor and somebody who's been treated badly by this system in my own community. So with this, I support this. However, there's still, there's still concerns that need to be addressed. And as critic for families, I'm willing and ready to work with the government and other government entities to make sure we get this right for Pegasus. Pegasus. Thank you. The Honorable Member for River Heights. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, we see the importance of uh, having this bill proceed uh, so that the Peguis First Nation and their Child and Family Services Agency uh, can uh, operate effectively together with uh, the provincial government and other First Nations uh, in order to look after the lives of children and families. Uh, we are very concerned about the quality of the data in the database, and we are very concerned about the need to uh, upgrade that quality and the need to have an ability for individuals uh, where there are allegations against them in the database to have uh, an ability to be made aware of those allegations and also to be able to uh, appeal uh, the allegations if they think that they are false and have the data in the database <clears throat> updated and corrected uh, where there are errors. Uh, this is a really, really important job and the changes in child welfare are highlighting this, uh, perhaps as they haven't been adequately highlighted before, although the minister and the government should have been well aware of these issues uh, because they have been around uh, as <clears throat> uh, the member for the PA, Kamisak, has, uh, has indicated for many years. And, and in spite of this being raised by individuals in this chamber over quite a number of years, the problems with the database still have not been adequately addressed. So uh, we look forward to this measure uh, moving forward, uh, but we look forward with some uh, trepidation and some concern about the information that's in the database and the need for the government uh, to uh, invest significant funds uh, with agencies around the province and perhaps in other ways to make sure that the quality of the information is at the standard uh, that it needs to be because we are working with the lives of children and families. I, I can tell you a couple of stories. Uh, one, um, this was a, a mother uh, who was in a First Nations community uh, and uh, she was, um, as usual, uh, ready to welcome her children coming home from school on the bus. Uh, and uh, 
but they didn't arrive. And she was in a bit of a panic as to what was happening, and so she started calling around, including to various sources, the police department saying the kids were missing, and uh, she, was, she found out that the kids had been apprehended. And uh, so um, she made inquiries as to who, what had been the, what was the reason and why was the apprehension occurring. Uh, and after her investigation, uh, what she found was this. Uh, she had been helping a niece of hers um, and she'd been helping the niece of hers by uh, providing uh, uh, a little bit of money here and there uh, to, to help her uh, uh, get along and, and uh, to help her, as she thought, have a better life. Well, her sister came to her and explained that what the niece was doing was to using that money to purchase drugs. And she said to this woman who was the mother whose children had been taken away, that uh, you have to stop giving her, the niece, any money at all. And so she did. And when she stopped giving the niece the money, uh, the niece got very upset and she called CFS and she made an accusation against this woman and her children were taken away. And this uh, accusation, which was not accurate, uh, resulted in the children being taken away and it took several years, not a day, not a week, not a month, not a year, several years until she got those kids back. It was horrible. And this was all because of an accusation made in revenge under this situation. And, and, you know, it's hard to explain to people who don't understand what is happening in families and in the system uh, that these sorts of inaccuracies can get into the system and cause problems and cause kids to be taken away from their families and put into care and information to get into the CFIS database I don't know 100% exactly what was put into the database, but I presume uh, that, um, that this information likely got into the database. I can tell you another story. And, and this, uh, as opposed to the first one, which I can verify all the details, uh, but this was a woman who was living in Manitoba housing, and, and she was very concerned about her kids and her kids being taken away. And, and if you're living in uh, poor circumstances and you don't have resources, um, you're very vulnerable. And uh, she was hearing and being told that, look, uh, don't you uh, do this, don't do this, or we'll, I'll, we'll send in an accusation and your kids will be taken away. Um, you know, this system which was set up to protect kids has not always worked nearly as well as it should have worked. And it's about time to finally get this database into shape uh, so that the information that's in there is known to be accurate, that false information and false accusations can be uh, addressed and corrected. Um, uh, we're going to be transferring private information. Um, this is continuing a practice which has been going on for some time, but uh, I think that even though we're ready to approve and support this bill, uh, we have some significant concerns, uh, and uh, it looks like the minister may be starting to listen uh, but there is an urgent need uh, to make sure that this database is much better than it is currently. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to say those few words. Uh -huh. The member for Kiwetanuk.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. To chance to share a few words on Bill 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act. Um, director, authorities, agencies, governing bodies, service providers, it, it's somewhat unfortunate that, that that's how we describe and, and we talk about our, our children in Manitoba. And I, and I say unfortunate because there, there's not necessarily a, a, a a finger to point at, at an individual or even a group of individuals, but as a collective here in Manitoba, we've now come to this point that we have to have all of these pieces in place rather than get at the root causes. And there's significant root causes. And of course, when we, we talk about child and family services and CFS system here in Manitoba, the children in care, uh, disproportionately, uh, those are Indigenous children. And uh, in, in, in some of my past roles, I, I've, I've been involved in, 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 in child welfare. And one thing I have consistently said, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is, is our goal in that role and, and as, as providers and, and workers in that system is to work yourself out of a job. And by that, I, I mean you, you've now come and you've gone full circle and you've, you've brought those children back to, not, no, to no longer having to feel they're dependent on or reliant on or a part of the, uh, the child welfare system or an apprehension system for that matter. Um, this bill brings forth, and the minister alluded to, it's, it's a step. Uh, are we there yet? Absolutely not. But it's a step in the right direction. So information sharing is also very important when it comes time to, to child welfare, not only in Manitoba, but across the country. Um, and when I say that, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, it's, it's about, there, there's, there's a number of factors that have been in place when we talk about the Privacy Act, um, children being taken into care, being apprehended, being taken miles away from home, communities, provinces, even countries away. Um, and that information has always kind of been, been, been bottled up, been put in a silo and, and not being able to be shared uh, with the people that are truly looking out for the best interests of those children. And Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, that, that's unfortunate that in, in some cases that, that was also used as a, as a reason to hide behind, to keep that perpetual system going because there, is, there, there seemed to be a, a, a reluctance to actually change the system, to get rid of the system, to unify those children back at home. And that should be the goal. So Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, th there is while this piece of legislation come forward is, is a step in the right direction, there is still work to be done. And during the, the, the Q&A part of, of debate here this afternoon, um, I, I asked a question about capacity and being able to actually, if you're going to turn over the system or you're going to turn over a certain portion or a certain aspect or certain programs in the system, are you in fact going to, to put the financial resources behind that too? Or are you setting Indigenous communities up, and in this case, the Indigenous governing bodies set up to fail. And why I say that, I mean the capacity and the financial ability to make this system work also. So this government can't offload that responsibility. They have to be able to, to include that as part of the capacity building process to be able to take this on. Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, there's been uh, a, a different levels, in, and you've heard, I'm sure everybody across the chamber has heard uh, communities say, we want to be in charge of our own child welfare system. We want to be able to have control of our own child welfare system. We want to be able to say when, where, how, and all aspects of where our children are and where they can come into contact with a system such as this. So those resources for those communities have to be there. So I did ask the question, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, about the fact of the definition of the Indigenous governing body. Because we have different levels here in the province. We have AMC, SAO, MKO, various tribal councils, various CFS agencies, including independent First Nations. So the question may, remains is if we have 60 plus First Nations here in Manitoba, if they all wanted to take on their own and be identified as an Indigenous governing body on their own as their home community, is the financial resource there to allow that to happen? Is that capacity going to be built into this legislation to allow that to happen? And it's not at this point, but it's a step in the right direction. So I do call on this government to actually come out and, and put some of those resources behind that too. 
A couple of years ago, Mr. Yaki, Deputy Speaker, there was, there was a hack to the Southern Authority system. And in that hack, it then froze all information that was in that system. And it was, a, it was very difficult for agencies to be able to access simple information, financial information, information and files that existed in that system. So we have to make sure information like that is never, for lack of a better term, held hostage by a, by a hacker or somebody else who has ill intent towards the system or towards a community or towards a family or towards children. So that capacity also needs to be built in there to, to allow those resources and allow that financial ability for organizations and communities to be able to, to fight off something like that, to protect themselves against something like that. Because information sharing is key when it comes time to indigenous children. And sometimes it's a matter of very quick. There's incidents that have, we, we've heard of maybe things happen over the course of years, over the course of months, but the reality is it happens many times in the course of a day. So those decisions and that information needs to be at the ready to be able to make a truly informed decision for the best interests of those children that are affected by this. And this is a step in the right direction, but it is not uh, the entirety of the solution here. It can't be offloading that responsibility by the government. They have to be able to invest those resources. And we've heard support also on this side of the chamber from Indigenous organizations, communities, leadership, even just community members, foster parents, parents. So we've seen support for this legislation to be able to share that information. So in that regard, uh, we are in support of this legislation to be able to share that information. But what I call upon is to increase that even more and to now put those financial resources, because there is financial components behind this also, to be able to, to invest those financial components so when we uh, put off the responsibility to these indigenous governing bodies that that financial capacity is there for them to be able to truly take that on. And that's important to be able to do. And Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, as we have here, this legislation, again, is a step in the right direction. Does it fall short? I believe it does because there could be still more investment in this. And that ability needs to happen. We can't just offload a responsibility and say, there you go, it's all done. While the, 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 the premise and the, the intent behind this is there, the good intent behind this is there, those financial capacity investments also need to be there to ensure that a system that an Indigenous governing body takes on is not something that's going to be detrimental to their own financial resources to be able to take on. Yeah. And it's set up to fail in that regard. So that investment needs to be there, and I call on a minister to do that too, whether it be in this legislation or further legislation. But this needs to be strengthened in that way. But as Bill 41 sits here today, the intent of, of sharing that information is important, and I support this motion. Are there any further speakers to second reading of Bill 41? Is the House ready for the question? question. The question before the House is second reading of Bill number 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, uh, can you please canvass the House to see if there's leave for the House and the Committee of the Whole to not see the clock today until the Committee has completed consideration of the following bills. Bill number 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act. Bill number 44, the Employment Standards Code Amendment Act, Minimum Wage. Bill number 234, the Drug Related Death Bereavement Day Act. Is leave for the House and Committee of the Whole not to see the clock until the Committee has completed consideration of the following bills? Bill 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act. Bill 44, the Employment Standards Amendment Code Act, Minimum Wage. Bill 234, Drug-Related Death Bereavement Day Act. Agreed? Agreed and a leave has been granted. It has been announced that the House will now resolve to... Oh, sorry. The Honorable Minister of Justice. You're ahead of me, Mr. Acting, uh, Mr. Acting, Deputy Speaker. Would you now please resolve the House uh, into Committee of the Whole to consider and report on the previously mentioned bills? 
it is it has been announced that the house will now resolve into committee of the whole to consider the and report on the following bill 41 the child and family services amendment act bill 44 the employment standards code amendment act minimum wage bill 234 the drug related death bereavement day act Mr. Assist, Assistant Deputy Speaker, please take the chair. Will the committee of the whole house please come to order? As announced, this committee will now consider the following. 
Bill number 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act. Bill 44, the Employment Standards Amendment Act, a Standards Code Amendment Act, minimum wage. Bill 234, the Drug-Related Death Bereavement Day Act. In what order does the committee wish to proceed with clause-by-clause clause consideration of these bills? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, could you please call them in order, uh, the following order, Bill 44, 234, and 41. It has been suggested that the committee do Bill 44, followed by Bill 234, followed by Bill 41. Is there agreement? Agreed and so ordered. Before we proceed with Bill 44, I want to make all members aware that we have received written submissions from the following. Kevin Rebeck, President of the Manitoba Federation of Labor. John Graham, Director of the Retail Council of Canada. Sean Jeffrey, Executive Director and CEO of the Manitoba Restaurant and Food Services Association. Kathleen Cook, Director Prairie and Northern Canada at the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. Jeff Traeger, President of UFCW. Lauren Remillard, President of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce. Scott Jocelyn, President of the Manitoba Hotel Association. Molly McCracken, Manitoba Director at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Kyle Ross, President of the Manitoba Government and General Employees Union. As per, the, as per the agreement of the House earlier, these submissions will be, a, will be appended to the Hansard transcript today. We will also email copies of the submission to all members. Does the Minister responsible for Bill 44 have an opening statement? Does, does the minister responsible for Bill 44 have an opening statement? We thank the minister. Does the critic from the official opposition have an opening statement? <laughs> the honourable member for Flin Flon. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker or Chair, whichever spot you're filling at the moment, uh, we're certainly not going to stop any, anything like this from passing, but it, it's a far cry from what the government could have done, what they should have done. People need to know immediately that the minimum wage is going up and what it's going up to, and all this bill really does is kick the can down the road and the minister says well we need time to consult they've had quite a few months that they could have been consulting already so that they were actually ready to increase the minimum wage they could have decided well every other jurisdiction in canada has raised the minimum wage already so we could have uh, said okay well we'll follow along and raise it immediately to 15 dollars and then consult as to where it really should be going forward to turn it into a actual living wage. The minister likes to perpetuate the myth that if, if you raise the minimum wage, businesses will go out of business, and time after time, jurisdiction after jurisdiction, that's shown to be, quite frankly, just not true. BC's raised their minimum wage uh, quite a while ago, and businesses didn't lose their business. People didn't go out of business. What is happening presently is with the rate of inflation that's gone up so dramatically, people can't afford to wait. And the minister said at the bill briefing this morning, well, uh, we want to make sure that businesses have time to 
to change their computer systems when potentially what the minister has set up is for businesses to have to change their computer systems twice in a year. Uh, he didn't guarantee that the uh, minimum wage would go up other than what's currently legislated on October 1st. He has until actually the end of the year under this legislation with no commitment, none whatsoever, as to where that minimum wage is going to be. He talks about businesses need predictability and he had the opportunity to provide them with advance notice of where that minimum wage is going to go. He didn't do that. So he's failed miserably in his job as being the minister. And really, we hope that he's listened to people. They're in the rushed business of passing this legislation, uh, several uh, entities, and I believe they've already been read into the record from the Manitoba Federation of Labor and uh, UFCW and CCPA have made submissions on short notice, uh, and they were been more than happy to be in consultation process with this minister and this government all along. And in fact, they've, they've had any number of, of pieces out there in the public saying what they thought minimum wage should have been. The minister had the opportunity to listen to them then. He didn't. The government didn't. The premier didn't. The only reason they're doing this now is because there's such a hue and cry going forward that we're dead last in the country with our minimum wage. So I hope the minister actually listens to what people are telling him now about where the minimum wage needs to be in order to be an actual living wage that may actually help people get out of poverty and be able to contribute more back into the province. So with those few words, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll conclude my remarks. We thank the member for those words. During the consideration of a bill, the enacting clause and the title are postponed until all other clauses have been considered in their proper order. Shall Clause 1 pass? Pass. Clause 1 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 2 pass? Clause 2 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 3 pass? I hear a no. The, the, the Honourable Member for Flint Flock. I don't, but it won't interfere with my ability to say what I want to say, which is once again that the Minister has kicked the can down the road. We don't know where he's going to land up. Is it going to be $15 or is it going to be $13.01 just so that they can be over what Saskatchewan is so that they're not dead last anymore? The minister hasn't given us any indication of where this is going to land up. Thank you. Shall... Oh. The member for Concordia. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, it's quite surprising that uh, once again we have no answers from this minister. Uh, no answers uh, uh, to the people of Manitoba who are asking what their minimum wage is going to be raised to. If we believe the uh, tweets of members opposite, uh, we might think one thing. If we hear the heckles from others, we might believe another. But at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of this minister to tell the people of Manitoba how they're going to rectify the damage that they've done over the past six years of government. It's quite, you know, quite frankly, it's unbelievable to me that the minister comes without any kind of prepared statement to introduce this, uh, this bill through the committee process, rushes it through the committee here as in Committee of the Whole, rather than going to the people of Manitoba to listen to them. Maybe he doesn't want to sit here all evening, uh, listen to uh, members of the public come in and tell them how impacted not only they have been, but in terms of labour, how the members of our labour community have been fighting year after year against this government's austerity and the impacts that it's having on working people in this province. It's, it's absolutely shameful that the minister wouldn't have an opening statement 
would so carelessly bring this forward and, and not even prepare, you know, maybe a couple of minutes of remarks, ram this bill through, push it through without any information for the people of Manitoba, and then when asked a question over and over and over and over again by the, the, the member for Flint Flon, who is standing up for people, the people of Manitoba, the working people in this province, I won't answer the most basic fundamental question, how much will he raise minimum wage? The, the minister goes around and says, you know, w you know, this was their talking point before, uh, before this bill came forward. They said, well, we want to depoliticize the minimum wage process. And yet here, the minister is playing ultimate politics with the, the minimum wage won't tell the people of Manitoba what the, what the minimum wage is going to be. Talk about predictability for employers, predictability for employees. This minister won't uh, reveal what, what uh, his premier is now telling him to do. So it's, it's frustrating. It's frustrating that here we are, uh, you know, in, in one afternoon or in just a couple of days, pushing through a bill that we have been, we have been asking this minister to address for the past six years. Um, without any input from the public, bypassing the regular, uh, the regular uh, business of the legislature, the, the regular process that we undertake. This minister could have brought this forward a month ago. He could have brought this bill forward uh, in, in the fall session. He could have brought this, for, this bill forward six years ago when the people of Manitoba told him that uh, their indexing of the minimum wage to a poverty wage was unacceptable. We've been calling for it consistently now, and we will continue to call on this government to step up and do their duty to make sure that the people of Manitoba who go to work every single day, that work 40 hours a week, don't live in poverty. It is the most basic thing that you could ask for in, uh, in a, a country like Canada and a province like Manitoba, that those who work hard are able to feed their families, feed themselves, and get ahead. This minister hasn't thought that that was a priority for the past six years. Now we're asking for him to just simply answer the question, how much, how much? Will he listen to the, the member that sits behind him or the member over there? Will he listen to his premier who said, we should listen to the people of Manitoba and call a proper committee? No, he'll continue to ram it through, won't give people answers, and uh, will continue to make this political when in fact it's about people and uh, their right to get a living wage. So, uh, I appreciate the indulgence of my friend from Flint Flon, who has done an amazing job fighting for this issue for six years now. Uh, and now finally, maybe the minister is starting to see the light. Hopefully he'll read the submissions that have been submitted. He'll listen to labor. He'll actually go back to the table and figure out how he can best support the working people of Manitoba. I don't have much faith but, uh, but I hope that uh, he undertakes that work over the summer, finally comes back to us, gives us a number, and uh, starts paying the people of Manitoba the wage they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The member for St. Boniface has a question. Uh, I had a, st a statement, if possible. I mean, I just wanted to say for the record that uh, when it comes to this bill, there's nothing but talk and there's no real commitments from either party, either the PCs or the NDP about what they actually want to do. Um, I'll just go back to 2005. In 2005, Manitoba had the second lowest average hourly earnings of all the provinces. The number of hours of full-time, full-year work required to reach the poverty line in Manitoba with the minimum wage at 2006 was 65 hours a week. 65 hours a week that was under the NDP so I can really be spared the sanctimony of the NDP who only now are promising to bring the minimum wage up to $15 the Manitoba Federation of Labor says it should be 16 and we actually don't know we have no timeline on what the minimum wage is going to be when it's going to, when it's going to actually go up to $15 or anything else we have no idea so we are basically have no goals this is all this is really just verging on very cynical feel-good politics to make it look like people are doing something when nothing is being done and I will remind the opposition that under the NDP there was a lower minimum wage for people with disabilities so I, I really 
the level of sanctimony is unbearable. We need to be paying people a, a, minimum, a, a decent wage, which has not happened in this province for decades. That's all I have to say. Shall Clause 3 pass? pass? Clause 3 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 4 pass? pass? I hear a no. The member for Flin Flon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's unfortunate that the minister has chosen to not answer anything that's been brought up this afternoon. Uh, one of the things that we learned at the bill briefing this morning although the minister also at that point in time refused to share the side-by-side -side for comparison purposes with us. He went through it but wouldn't give us a copy of it, said that they never did. Well, I found some in my files from previous labour bills where they in fact were there. So, you know, it, it's once again just this minister, this government refusing to be open and transparent with people of Manitoba and certainly not sharing the information properly with the opposition. But to get back to my original point, it, it seems that if the minister deems that the minimum wage should go up because of this year, for example, where the uh, uh, inflation rate is running somewhere north of 6 percent, but if next year the, the cost of living is running at 4.9 percent, the minister with this piece of legislation, and he can clarify this if he wishes, with this piece of legislation it would mean that working Manitobans wouldn't get an increase in the next year because the inflation rate only went up 4.9 percent. So workers, even if they get an increase this year because of, of, of inflation, will again be left next year to fall behind again. So the minister can answer if that is correct. I believe that was the, the uh, answers that I got from the minister and, and another uh, MLA who was there answering questions this morning for some reason as well. So uh, the whole premise of this bill is, is, is to kick it down the road as far as possible to make sure that they don't raise it any more than they absolutely have to, which is why they won't tell us what the number is, and then to make sure that going forward they don't actually have to keep the minimum wage going up with, with inflation, that this will leave them an out card to ensure that people don't keep getting ahead, that people will once again fall into the trap of falling behind. So with those uh, few words, uh, the minister certainly I look forward to him disputing anything I've just said or answering the question. The Honourable Minister of Labour, Consumer Protection and Government Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, obviously the member opposite didn't listen to the briefing this morning and he's wrong. The member for Flin Flon. Well, I certainly did because, in fact, I asked that very question for someone to explain it better to me at the briefing, and that is the answer that I was given. Thank you. Shall Clause 4 pass? Clause 4 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 5 pass? Clause 5 is accordingly passed. Shall the enacting clause pass? The enacting clause is accordingly passed. Shall the title pass? The title is accordingly passed. Shall the bill be reported? Agreed, the bill shall be reported. We will now move on to clause by clause of Bill 234 the Drug-Related Death Bereavement Day Act. Before we proceed with Bill 234, I want to make 
All members aware that we have received written submissions from Janice Gillum, a private citizen, and Arlene Last Kolb from Overdose Awareness Manitoba. As per the agreement of the House earlier, these submissions will be appended to the tran Hanser transcript for today. We will also email copies of the submission to all members. Does the bill sponsor the Honourable Member for Point Douglas have an opening statement? The Honourable Member for Point Douglas. Miigwech. Um, I just want to thank members opposite for supporting this bill. Certainly it's a step in the right direction and a direction that we need to be heading in. We also need to you know, look at making sure that there's reporting done so that we can accurately you know, get the resources in place that Manitobans need. We had 372 deaths in 2019, 407 in 2020. This is trending in the wrong direction and you know, certainly a safe consumption site in this province would help us. Uh, families have been calling for this for you know, uh, probably the last six months. So I just want to really, um, you know, say thank you for listening to those families. And certainly this is going to help e end stigma, you know, um, educate the public around drug use and hopefully help those who are struggling get the help that they need. And um, we want to ensure that, you know, Manitobans get the support so that we're not having to have these bereavement days or add families to um, coming to these bereavement days. Certainly we've seen, you know, this number grow and that's not something that we want to see with Manitobans. You know, these are our community members, these are our loved ones, and these are friends and families. And, you know, I, I want to, you know, dedicate this to a few people. Um, the member from St. John's mother, Sharon Fontaine, um, as well as my own father, Steve Tayo and uh, Kyle Kimach, who was the co-founder of Drag the Red, um, did lots of work in the community, you know, whether that was supporting uh, folks with addictions that were along the riverbanks and helping them to, you know, have a purpose coming on the boat and helping to search for loved ones. Um, he certainly helped lift a lot of uh, folks out of um, addictions. Um, and then certainly I want to, you know, acknowledge all of the families that um, spoke with me friends, families, organizations, you know, that um, help contribute to this bill. This bill is really um, the making of their work. So I want to acknowledge all of them and all of the families who are grieving a loss of a loved one and that, uh, you know, to let them know that I dedicate the work that I'm doing to continue to support and advocate for the supports that they need so that, um, you know, we don't have to have another one die of an overdose in this province. So miigwech. Does any other member wish to make an opening statement on Bill 234? The Honourable Mem Minister of Mental Health and Community Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I won't take up too much time, but I, I too would like to acknowledge the member for Point Douglas, thank her for bringing this bill forward. I think this is gonna be a very important uh, day for many families in Manitoba to come together uh, and share in the journey of grief. It is a complicated grief um, when you lose a loved one uh, to drug overdose, uh, and it is important that, mem that uh, citizens have a place to go uh, to speak about their journeys, um, to also help support families who are newly in, um, included within um, uh, this uh, tragic um, community, um, but also to give hope for the future and be a part of uh, ending stigma uh, and contributing to uh, harm reduction uh, strategies here in the province. So thank you again to the member for Point Douglas um, I really appreciate her efforts and I thank the families that I met with as well who contributed their feedback uh, and support for this bill and we are happy as a government uh, to stand together <clears throat> with members uh, opposite uh, to pass this bill. Thank you. The member for Tyndall Park. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson, and I just want to echo some of the thoughts that are being shared here this afternoon and 
thank the member, commend her for the work and the diligence she has done on this legislation and for bringing so many folks down to the legislature. I think it makes this legislation very impactful to see the faces of so many who have been impacted by loss of overdose and going through that bereavement process. And I think that this legislation has created a lot of dialogue amongst us as MLAs and very healthy dialogue to better educate ourselves within the system as well, Mr. Chairperson. And that's why I want to thank the member for bringing it forward. And I think it's important that we as a province continue to move forward in a positive way with mental health. And that's one reason we should be investing in more resources in creating more days of awareness such as this. Um, I'll leave my remarks at that. During the consideration of the bill, the preamble, the national clause. During the consideration of a bill, the preamble, enacting clause, and title are postponed until all other clauses have been considered in their proper order. Shall clause one pass? I hear a no. The member for Point Douglas. Miigwech. I uh, would like clause one of the bill amended by striking out Sunday before Mother's Day and substituting the first Sunday in May. The member for Point Douglas. Miigwech. I move that Clause 1 of the bill be amended by striking out Sunday before Mother's Day and substituting first Sunday in May. It has been moved by the member for Point Douglas that Clause 1 of the bill be amended by striking out Sunday before Mother's Day and substituting first Sunday in May. The amendment is in order. The floor is open for questions. No questions. Is the committee ready for the question? Shall the amendment pass? The amendment is accordingly passed. Shall clause one pass? Shall clause one as amended pass? Clause one as, amendment, as amended is passed. Shall clause two pass? Clause 2 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 3 pass? Clause 3 is accordingly passed. Shall the preamble pass? The preamble is accordingly passed. Shall the enacting clause pass? The enacting clause is accordingly passed. Shall the title pass? The title is accordingly passed. Shall the bill as amended be reported? Agreed. Agreed. The bill as amended shall be reported. We will now move on to clause by clause of Bill 41, the Child and Family Services Amendment Act. Does the minister responsible for Bill 41 have an opening statement? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I just want to say how much of an honour it has been to uh, be invited to sharing circles and ceremonies with Indigenous governing bodies as they've been walking down this path towards exercising <coughs> jurisdiction over child and family services and, um, and how impactful some of the stories that I've heard on this journey that I've had alongside 
um, as, as the minister responsible for the child and family services in the province of Manitoba to hear uh, firsthand about the shortcomings and the failings of a decades old system and then to also be on the cusp of this transformation. It has been uh, truly remarkable and the one thing that has never been lost on me is the spirit of, of willingness and forgiveness and acceptance and um, welcoming that, um, that I've received as a Minister of the Crown when um, meeting with First Nations on talking about um, the Child and Family Services uh, Act and the forthcoming amendments and, and the history of the CFS system. And um, it is in that spirit of collaboration that they invited me into their circles to talk about the need for a new era of child welfare that I, that I hope to set the table for all, all of us in this chamber and, and all um, future um, members of this chamber who will be debating and discussing the, the, um, the framework for child welfare and to enter into that, those discussions and those debates with a desire to achieve better outcomes for children and a better pathway forward. And, and it is my sincere hope that um, Bill 41 is the start of the depoliticization of child welfare so that we can all um, come into an, an agreement. And I think um, to, to sit at the table with um, Indigenous communities who have been predominantly, disproportionately, and um, negatively impacted by some of the former uh, systems in place and to be welcomed at that table in a spirit of, of love is, is, um, is remarkable. And I, and I hope that they lead the example on the way we need to be discussing child uh, and family services in this, in this province. And so with that, I just wanna say thanks to all my fellow colleagues in this chamber for expediting this um, this bill it was recently introduced and and here we are um, hopefully on the cusp of, of this bill receiving royal assent which is going to mean a lot it is the first of its kind in in Canada my officials had no framework to draw upon we were we were literally at the drawing board ourselves in drafting this legislation and it is the first uh, piece of legislation to amend the CFS um, Act in ways to adapt and, and um, adjust to this new era. And there will be future legislative amendments required um, that, that, I, that I certainly hope this, this bill and the way this House has come together to see this bill uh, brought forward um, will create that pathway for future amendments um, to also be, be brought into this House. So with that, I just, again, want to thank all members of this House. It's, it's really historic. When, um, when you think about it for, for multiple reasons. And, and I'm just truly grateful that we're here to debate um, at this bill at this stage. We thank the minister for those comments. Does the critic from the official opposition have an opening statement? The member for DePaul Kamisak. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I agree with the Minister of Families that this is indeed a historic day uh, for First Nations in regards to child welfare. Uh, I'm especially proud of my community of Pegasus First Nation. Um, they've always been trailblazers in many aspects of uh, government. And uh, I can share too that um, OCN was um, on their way too to uh, this new legislation change and to our own laws. So I'm hoping that my First Nation will get on board and be as progressive as Pegwest First Nation. Um, it's exciting. Uh, obviously, I support this legislation. It's exciting that this is being pushed through. Um, but I, you know, with, of course, there's, there's concerns, you know, as a mother and as a MLA for this area and as the critic. Um, I believe that um, for the Indigenous communities that are, are choosing to take legislative authority over their children and care, I'm concerned about the actual system that's in place currently that's outdated. Um, sensitive sense of information is stored here, and uh, there's going to be have to be you know capacity 
building in the future in regards to this, like obviously Peguas has that capacity. I've always admired their leadership. And uh, we have Grand Rapids, Mississippi, creation is also on that path as well. Um, I got to share that the, the, a lot of the comments regarding this are of concern, uh, especially within the communities. There's a lot of, they don't trust the system, so which is under provincial. And so how we're gonna trust it, you know, when it's under indigenous. And these are comments from the community talking to chief and council and child welfare service workers in the community. So I agree with them because I've been touched and destroyed by this system myself. And I really want to encourage that Manitoba still has conversations with us, even though this is going to be passed over. And I'm just concerned, you know, when issues come up, we're going to be, that's your jurisdiction. Again, it's going to be that all over again. And I'm, the children, are still Manitobans too. And I would like to know the relationship too with M-A-C-Y. And um, I like to ensure that this system needs, pro you know, an overhaul too with the environment with our workers that are working in. We need respect for the families. We need compassion. I can tell you that I've been not treated that way, especially as the MLA for the PAW, you know, so I'm concerned, you know, and, but I encourage it. I really do. I, I really, this is progressive thinking, but I'm worried as a mother and who's someone who has been destroyed by this system. So I just want to encourage that conversation still include the province of Manitoba while we're on this journey. So again, I, I support this legislation and it's pretty awesome how it's been pushed through. And I'm looking forward to working with my community of Peguas to ensure this is gonna be successful and safe. And I really wanna push for the reunification files. Like I said, one file tower, reunification. Towers and towers of files for children in care. So let's fix that and I'm willing to work with you on that. Peguas. We thank the member for those comments. During the consideration of a bill, the enacting clause and title are postponed until all other clauses have been considered in their proper order. Also, if there is agreement from the committee, the chair will call, clause, will call clauses and blocks that conform to pages with the understanding we will stop at any particular clause or clauses where members may have comments, questions, or amendments to propose. Is that agreed? Agreed. Shall clause one through three pass? Clauses one through three are accordingly passed. Shall clause four pass? Clause four is accordingly passed. Shall clause five pass? Clause five is accordingly passed. Shall clauses six and seven pass? Clauses six and seven are accordingly passed. Shall clause eight pass? Clause eight is accordingly passed. Shall clause nine pass? Clause nine is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 10 through 13 pass? Clauses 10 through 13 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 14 pass? I hear a no. The member for Tyndall Park. I want to move an amendment. Okay, I move that the following be added after clause 13 of the bill Within one year after the coming into force of this section, the minister must undertake a comprehensive. Oh, okay. Is there leave of the house for an amendment to? Oh, 
Is the leave of the House to revert back to Clause 13? Agreed? The member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the following be added after Clause 13 of the bill. Within one year after the coming into force of this section, the minister must undertake a comprehensive review of the amendments made by this act that includes public representations. Within one year after the review is undertaken or within any longer period that the Legislative Assembly allows, the Minister must table a report on the review in the Assembly. It has been moved by Ms. Lamaru, the member for Tyndall Park, that clause... The following be added after Clause 13 of the bill. Review 13.1 bracket 1. Within one year after coming into force of this section, the minister must undertake a comprehensive review of the amendments made by this act that includes public representations. Tabling report in assembly 13.1 brackets 2 within one year after review is undertaken or within any longer period that the Legislative Assembly allows, the Minister must table a report on the review in the Assembly. The amendment is in order. The floor is open for questions. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Does the member have a list of um, Indigenous governing bodies that she consulted with on this amendment? And if she does, could she please table that? The member for Tyndall Park. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. And my colleague, uh, the MLA for River Heights, has actually been working with uh, the minister and her department on this legislation. And I believe they would have consulted about this. The member, the minister, the honourable minister of families. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with all due respect, I am a little taken aback that we would be put bringing forward an amendment to a bill that is in empowering Indigenous governing bodies to exercise jurisdiction without a list of Indigenous governing bodies that was consulted on the on the amendment. And so, uh, respectfully, I, I am not um, inclined to uh, move on this at this particular moment. But I certainly will. Um, speak with um, our partners on this legislation and Indigenous governing bodies in the future, and if they wish to um, see something like that brought forward, I would be open to that in the future, but at this particular moment, that is not the case. The member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, and I think it's important to be proactive on legislation and if we can create a clause that would ensure that a year from now we can check in to see how the legislation is being implemented, that is a nice safeguard to have in place. The Honourable Minister of Families. I think it's really important to do proper consultation, and this legislation is one that is supported by um, the partners that I've worked with. In, in community and other Indigenous governing bodies for whom this legislation is, is critically important. And in, I would like to just remind the member that um, this legislation is, is pertinent for um, passage as soon as possible, and I certainly hope that uh, she is not providing um, indication that there's going to be a delay in passage because that would be <coughs> not beneficial to the communities for whom uh, rely on this legislation. Is the committee ready for the question? Shall the amendment pass? 
The amendment is accordingly defeated. Shall Clause 13 pass? Clause 13 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 14 pass? Clause 14 is accordingly passed. Shall the enacting clause pass? The enacting clause is accordingly passed. Shall the title pass? Shall the bill be reported? The title is accordingly passed. Shall the bill be reported? Agreed, the bill shall be reported. This con that concludes the business before the committee. The hour being 4.50, what is the will of the committee? Rise. Committee rise, call the speaker. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Is there a will of the House to recognize the clock as five? Is it the will of the House to call it five o'clock? Agreed. Agreed and so ordered. The hour being 5 p.m., this House is adjourned and stands adjourned until 1.30 p.m. tomorrow.